All right. Looks like we have a quorum. Yeah. Alex, do we have everybody in now? Yes, we should have everyone in, and I believe I'm ready to go whenever you guys are. John, Paul's in your corner. Okay, we're ready. We're ready? Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Okay, I'd like to call to order the planning, regular planning commission session for January 4th, 2002-1. Happy New Year. Um, before we go on, I want to read the state standard statement. I would like to, this meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom process. The planning commission and city staff are participating from remote locations and votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to MalibuCity.org slash forward slash virtual meeting. <clears throat> At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions on the screen under the sign uh, up to speak tab. Once you have once the item is called, no further speaker signups will be allowed, so please make sure you visit MalibuCity.org slash virtual meeting early and download the Zoom applications to sign up to speak. The recording secretary will call those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must have a be present at the Zoom meeting to be recognized. The applicant team for public hearings will have total of 15 minutes to speak, including any rebuttal time. Members of the public will be afforded three minutes only. No additional time will be allowed to be donated to another speaker. Commissioners, if you have comments to make during the meeting, raise your hand so I can call on you in turn uh, to make your discussion clear for the public record. Um, having said that, if you didn't know that, you, you didn't hear it right now, and how you're going to sign up. Um, okay. May we have a roll call, please? Yes. Um, Commissioner Jennings? Here. Commissioner Weil? Here. Vice Chair Marks? Here. Chair Mazza? Here. You have a quorum. Uh, Chris, on your last meeting, would you like to do the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Standing for it. All right, everyone ready? Here we go. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, the United States, States, States of America, America. and to, to the Republic, Republic for, for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right. Thank you, Chris. Thank uh, you. I can tell who has uh, desk machines versus laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Okay, may we have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move the agenda uh, with uh, item 4A pushed out to the January 19th meeting. We have a second. I second. Okay, may we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Um, Commissioner Weil? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Chair Mazza? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, when we have a report on posting of the agenda? Yes. Um, one moment. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on December 22nd, 2020. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any speaker from the public? On item 2A? Yes, for uh, oral communication with, uh, with uh, that does not have anything to do with the items that we are hearing tonight. Yes, we have one speaker, Mr. Craig Hill. Okay, Craig, go for it. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners and staff. I hope you've all been able to find some joy with over the holidays. A couple quick things. Um, 
I asked staff about whether the STR permits are whether and when they're going to be available for, uh, for example, in the on base database. And a couple staff members have been trying to chase down the answer to that question. And I just thought maybe uh, somebody might know something tonight, or if not, maybe commissioners might like to comment on the availability of STR permits for viewing. Um, secondly, there's been a lot of talk, as you're all aware, about how these meetings can be better configured to do, be doing things like um, allotting minutes to other people and or allowing people to call in with video at their option and various sorts of things have been proposed. And, and I just want to underscore that it's going to be the planning commission that will be the, the testing ground for that. So hopefully you guys are thinking about um, ways that we might be improving this Zoom process. Um, and then finally, just by way of a sort of a public announcement, um, one piece of data in the New York Times, they say one in 12 people in LA County now has COVID. And, uh, you know, I think it's easy to feel like we're, we see the light at the end of the tunnel and maybe we're in the home stretch, but at the same time, things are really taking off in Southern California, as you all know, but I just thought I'd point out the one in 12 is, is a pretty shocking number. Um, so everybody take care of yourselves and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay. Well, we'll pull, close the public comments and go to commissioner comments. Who would like to speak? Nothing for me. Nobody. Okay. I would, um, at the last meeting, we did discuss uh, Craig's asking for, I believe it was Craig at the time, asking for uh, better ways to run this meeting and and to actually make it a little shorter because sometimes it's getting a little hard to stay awake after four or five hours. Um, and I believe Jeff answered that we are the ones that determine that. So... <clears throat> There's two things I want to ask. Uh, one of Richard, uh, we asked you to bring back a report on and, and agendize an item. Do, do you, could that happen at the next meeting? Will it happen? So <clears throat> wanted to speak to that this evening. And I, and Trevor uh, can also assist in this too, but that was we did discuss this and on this issue of sharing minutes or donating minutes i should say the the city council did discuss this at, at the beginning of covid in the beginning of using the zoom platform and there were some concerns raised and uh, surprisingly enough i know it sounds weird but there was some concern about equitability and fairness because under our current electronic platform software platform what could happen is that one person could sign in multiple times and there's no way for us to verify uh, if it's the same person signing in uh, to, to donate minutes, so to speak. And so we are working with the vendor of our software to see if there are perhaps some better ways that we could run this so that would we, we would have the ability to ensure that if you know, somebody donates a minute, it's a legitimate account. You know, when we do a, a planning commission meeting or a city council meeting, you know, we want that person who's donating time to be in the room and stand up and, and show they're a real person. So this is something that the uh, staff of the city, the uh, our IT folks are working on. But further along with what you guys are discussing up here as commissioners, it is my understanding that the city council is going to once again take up this item at its next at its upcoming meeting on the 11th is my understanding and we will see if the council changes their position on it now that we have newer members you know the council's last direction to staff was that all subcommittees and commissions would be following the same protocols as the city council. And as you know, they do not share or uh, let folks donate minutes. However, with that being said, I would like to remind the commission that the leeway that you do have in the meantime, until the council changes this, 
is that one, if somebody is speaking and they're making a point uh, that the chair or feels needs to continue, uh, you know, the chair could allow the person to speak and to continue to speak, I should say. And an additional option available for the members of the planning commission are that if somebody speaks and they don't get to finish their thought and it is something that somebody who's sitting up at the dais or our virtual dais feels uh, would be more um, important to delve into, uh, we can recall folks and ask them questions even if they're not the applicant. We, we could do that to regular members of the public. And you know, lastly, I'll end this with, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure if there is consensus too, we can also uh, share this concern that we are not being able to uh, grant additional time to folks. If there's consensus, I could uh, relay that to the city council. And Trevor, is there anything uh, you felt that you'd like to add or I missed? No, I, I think you have it covered there, there Richard. You know. Trevor, uh, I don't remember the city taking any formal action. They discussed it. Do they need to take formal action to take control of our meeting? I, I don't know the exact history, you know, when this was all getting started, but I mean, this is the process that's, that's been imposed by the city council. If they want to change it, they obviously can do that. So, um, you know, the council wants to pick this up and to change it. If they want to add video, they want to donate minutes, they want to change the minute allocation, you know, th those are things that they can do. Now, uh, the question of adding video, are we saying that, Nobody can show videos. Uh, the, I think people are able to, to present video evidence or, or PowerPoints as part of what they're presenting, but um, people showing themselves on video, I don't think that's that's allowed, right, Richard? No, I don't mean that. I mean, if somebody came in, say, in opposition to some something, brought in the video, they can they can give it to the city, and the city will show it. Yes, we yep. got most recent what pops into my mind actually is um, at the city council when we were discussing the wireless ordinance, we were accepting videos from the public and we were then digitizing those and while they were speaking, we would show uh, was, if it was a picture or in one case, a member of the public had their, I think their two children put together a video, we played that and then there have also been actual presentations. Uh, just like staff presentations that folks make within their three minutes. So we will share that. Okay. And I guess one of your questions was <clears throat> verifying who's actually talking. Um, <clears throat> is there a reason why we can't turn on the, the commenter's camera and see who it is? I would, yeah, you know, I'm sure you can, you know, these are things that, 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 that could be done. It just takes more time if you're going to, you know, pull people up and do those things. I, I, it sounds like, the, I don't know the, you know, maybe Alice could, can't, well, we could find out, but maybe they were looking at something where you could just verify through some IP address or something. So you wouldn't need to stop, check everybody, you know, uh, you could just verify that they're there. I, I don't know, but yes, you could, you could do it the way you're talking about though. Okay. Okay, is there consensus to have Richard come back, uh, Richard present to the City Council our desire to open up our meetings and um, come back to us with a report on what happened? I'd, I'd be done with that. Yeah, me too. Uh, let me just point out to, to staff, I mean, it's an obscure reference, but we don't often have to go back to it, but um, Municipal Code Section um, 2.36.100 says, among other things, um, commission shall adopt such rules and regulations as it deems necessary to provide for its other officers, their method of selection, and for other matters relative to its work and administration. So if the city council is going to tell us that, that uh, we can't make our own rules, then maybe they need to change the code. Do you have a, uh, so we have consensus. Do you have a comment on that, Trevor? Yeah. No, I guess it's, it's great if, if Richard can if you can bring this up when it's uh, at the next meeting and let them know. Uh, is, can we get more direction? Are you, did you guys want both video and time donation? Were there any other items that you want to have done? It sounds like you're willing to be the guinea pig if they want to try out with the planning commission first and then get a report back about how it's how it works and 
Does, does that sound like what you're looking for? Well, my question really was Jeff's sighting. And uh, what I would like, if, unless you think there's something wrong with that sighting, that uh, we determine what we're doing. And, and a quick observation, Chair Maz, if I may? Sure. Yeah. Um, one other just thought is when we're in City Hall, you know, what we typically do is we'll say, okay, John, you're getting three minutes from Sally. Is Sally here? And we kind of look in the audience and do a visual confirmation. I'm guessing that, you know, if, if Sally, in this case, could just speak, a lot of the time we'll be like, hey, this is Sally. I'm giving John my minutes. Oh, yeah, that sounds like Sally's voice. I mean, it's, it's going to be kind of to our discretion to either do whatever we feel confident would be verification of who that person is, right? I mean, we don't like need to have someone hold up their driver's license or something to verify. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just I'm just kind of playing through kind of on Jeff's line of thought that within reason, we would confirm identity. Yeah, no, you, you would not be able to require someone to show the driver's license anyway. Exactly, for example. So um, anyway, just, just as a thought, it seems like, you know, we just do a visual at the city hall, maybe just voice is good enough in this in this protocol and we can kind of figure out what works and doesn't work is all I feel The chairman can, or the chairman with your approval can uh, change change rules. Right. Uh, now, Trevor says code section 203 or whatever it was. What's wrong with using that? Let me pull up the the the, the section. And, and um, while that's but, come, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, there's also value in you know we've ever been through a pandemic before. I think part of you know what the council wants is everyone to have expectations about how to, this works and not to be confused and how they use the technology, but. Um, you know, in general, yes, the, the commission has its ability to, to sort of pull its own rules and, you know, run its meetings, you know, in an efficient manner. Um, you know, I think we, we'd have to, we could look farther into the history about this and, and, and the extent of, you know, what direction the council has given about this in the past. But, you know, the upshot is, you know, I think the, the play here is to bring it to the council to get their, to get their input on it and then bring it back to the commission at the, at the next meeting and you guys can make a decision about what you want to do. Okay. Um, uh, two other things, John, when you're done. Sure, uh, I'm done. Okay, um, just one other one in part of this conversation, I think we should figure out how to best, um, you know, that hand raising concept to somehow to monitor that, to see if there's, you know, six, seven, 10 hands raised to, to really be sure to open up some type of a, an input if, if, if we feel appropriate. And then the last bit is, um, great to see you back, Trevor. I know the last couple of meetings we'd had Patrick here. Um, who sh who do you think we uh, will be typically on these um, on the the planning commission calls going forward in, in your role? Would you expect? Um, you'll be seeing me. You probably be seeing Pat. You know, sometimes okay. kind of swap um, off. You know, I, depends. Okay, very well. That was all I had, John. Thank you, uh, Trevor. Who should we call? Uh, you're welcome to you, you're welcome to call me or you can call pat as well you can call you know any of us you know it's, it's, so okay uh now you, yeah on another subject uh this question about where you can see a light and see um who's got a, a an application or a, a, a short-term license granted uh, i just want to remind the public that if you don't have it on the 15th, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you don't have it on the 15th and you have an ad on the RBO, you're going to get dinged, and you only get two dings a year. So if you have it on the 15th and the 16th and the 17th, you're out. So uh, I, I want people to understand that these are new rules, and you got to follow them or your license. There's specific ordinance that can pull your license. Uh, so this is a serious thing that people better understand. Um, and obviously if people want to see who's got the licenses, you'll be watched. <laughs> um, correct, Trevor? Yeah, if, if, well, it, I mean, what you're talking about could be a different, it depends on, you know, if somebody has a license and they didn't post it or someone doesn't have a license and they're advertising, these are different violations. Both have significant fines, but 
if you don't have a license and you're advertising the fine is more significant. So uh, glad you're bringing it, it to the attention of everyone, anyone that is renting their property short term. If you don't have your license in place, um, you know, when we hit January 16th, make sure you take it down. You know, it, you know, don't don't keep that posted up there. Um, even if you're not renting at that time, please don't have that up there um, until you have your you, you've got your license in place. This also includes print advertising. Yep. And you should get your if you haven't already, you should get your application in right away because it does take time to process it. If you turn it in on the 14th, you can't expect it's going to be turned around immediately. OK, any other uh, comments? Other than Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, OK. Um, do we have anybody uh, who wishes to pull anything from the consent calendar? In this case, it's the minutes for December 7th. No. OK, I mean, we have a roll call on that, please. Uh, yes. Um... Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Who um, made the motion and who seconded it, please? Uh, let's okay. see. John made the motion and I'll second it. How's that? Super. Thank you. Um, Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Weil? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Motion carries. Okie doke. Uh, item 4A was continued. So we're now on item 4B, which is Coastal Development Permit Number 19-001, Variance Number 19-001, Site Plan Review Number 19-001, and minor, minor Modification number 19-001, an application for a new single family residence and associated development continued from December 7th, 2020 for 20272 Inland Lane. May we have a staff report, please. Yes, good evening, Chair Maza and members of the Planning Commission. The project before you tonight is an application for a CDP for a new single family residence. Tonight, I will discuss the history of the project, the proposed project, and correspondence received regarding the project. Next slide. The subject parcel is in the Big Rock neighborhood and is affected by the Big Rock Mesa landslide. The graphic shows the Big Rock Mesa Landslide Assessment District boundary and the subject parcel is highlighted in yellow. Public Works Director Rob DeBow is present to respond to questions pertaining to the Big Rock Mesa Landslide dewatering efforts. The applicant team is also present and available for questions. Next slide. The subject parcel is inland of the Pacific Coast Highway located in the single family low dense City Zoning District. The site is currently vacant. Next slide. In 1968, a residence and garage were constructed on the subject property as shown in this 1972 photo. According to county assessor data, the residence was 2,184 square feet. No data regarding the garage could be located. The concrete footprint of the development was 3,177 square feet. Next slide. The residence was damaged in the Malibu Topanga fire in 1993 and was later demolished. Next slide. On August 7, 2012, the Planning Commission approved an application from the previous property owner for a new one-story residence, including a variance from the city's geotechnical standards for factor of safety and a minor modification to reduce the side yard setbacks. Next slide. On November 6, 2017, the Planning Commission approved an amendment involving a demolition permit for the slab and the septic system a modification to the design of the residence and a new detached cabana. The previously approved variants and minor modification were included in the request, but were amended. A new site plan review was also added to increase the maximum height of the residence up to 24 feet, and a time extension request was also included to change the expiration date. 
The approval was appealed to the city council and the city council upheld the planning commission's approval. The city council's approval was then appealed to the coastal commission. The coastal commission staff informed the applicant that it intended to recommend denial of the project because the time extension request was not filed in a timely manner and the CDP had expired. The applicant withdrew the application and submitted the subject new CDP application. The demolition permit was not appealed and the demolition of the concrete slab in the septic system has been completed. Next slide. The subject parcel is an irregularly shaped lot. The lot descends steeply to PCH to the south and the entire slope area was restricted as a geological hazard area. Next slide. The subject CDP is a new project for a two-story single-family residence and attached, attached garage in Cabana. And this project statistics are listed here. Next slide. The site plan depicts the proposed residence in Cabana uh, and elevations for the per pedestrian gate that would be altered to comply with few permeability requirements. Next slide. The Cabana plans were inadvertently omitted from the agenda report plan set, and we can provide those um, Later, the cabana is 11 feet high and open on three sides. The fourth side is, is open with the exception of a fireplace and chimney, as you can see in the north elevation. Next slide. The application involves a variance from the city's geotechnical standards for factor of safety, a site plan review for a roof height in excess of 18 feet up to 24 feet and a minor modification for the reduction of the required side yard setback. Next slide. As far as the variance, the Big Rock Mesa landslide presents special circumstances because it is infeasible to rebuild a residence on the subject property in a fashion that would provide the code required 1.5 static and 1.1 pseudostatic factors of um, factors of safety specified by the LCP. The application of the factor of safety standard would prevent any construction on the site and would likely constitute a taking. A variance from the city's factor of safety is included in the application to avoid taking of the site. This does not mean that the property is cleared from potential landslide hazards. The project has been designed, however, to produce a higher degree of site and structural performance than what previously existed on the site, and measures are proposed that would neither create nor contribute significantly to erosion, geologic instability, or destruction of the site or surrounding area. Next slide. Several homes were built in the Big Rock Mesa landslide area subsequent to 1993. All of these residences are located on parcels that provide less than the LIP standard factors of safety. Next slide. The project includes a site plan review for a building height exceeding 18 feet up to 24 feet for a flat roof. As shown in the north elevation, the ground floor would be visible from inland lane, but the lower level would be tucked under the ground floor and would be visible from the ocean as shown in the south elevation but would not be visible from inland lane. The majority of the square footage of the proposed residence would not be visible from inland lane or from neighboring properties. The project does not exceed 24 feet in height and does not adversely affect neighborhood character. Next slide. The residence has been designed to appear as a one-story, 18-foot high structure from the east and the west, with the lower level of the house tucked below the ground floor. Next slide. Due to the irregular shape of the subject property, the proposed project is 95 feet 8 inches from the front property line and would be less visible than nearby residences as viewed from inland lane. Next slide. Three properties within 1,000 feet of the project site have requested primary view determinations. The project conforms with primary view protection standards because the portions of the structure that are higher than 18 feet in height are behind and obscured by the portions of the residence that is 18 feet in height. Next slide. The 
the irregularly shaped property has two east side yard setback areas and a minor modification is requested to reduce the east side yard setback area number one located along the driveway shared by the applicant's neighboring lot to the east. And this area is shown in blue in this graphic. The setback would be reduced by one foot 10 inches. The remainder of the east side yard setback shown as area number two in green conforms with the setback standards. The proposed setbacks are similar to those found throughout the neighborhood, including those of the property to the east, which has a zero side yard setback. Next slide. This photo shows the story poles from Inland Lane looking directly at the site. Next slide. And west of the property, the fence obscures views of the story poles from in the lane shown here. Next slide. And another photo from in the lane. Next slide. Uh, as you can see in the photo to the left, all development is proposed on the flat area of the property. Uh, no development is proposed on the slope. And then you can see another photo taken from Inman Lane, somewhat to the east of the project site. Next slide. Subsequent to the publication of the agenda report, additional correspondence <coughs> was received from the applicant as well as members of the public. These letters are listed here and have been distributed to the Planning Commission. Uh, and we just received right before the hearing um, email correspondence from Georgia Gold Farm opposing the project. Um, this is not, I don't believe this has been distributed to the Planning Commission yet, but um, we will distribute that as soon as we can. Next slide. That concludes my presentation. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission adopt resolution number 2001 approving the CDP site plan review and minor modification. And I forgot to add here the variance as well. Um, I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, who wants to, do, do you want to hear the public first or does anybody want to ask a question? Can we take our disclosures first? Sure, I'm sorry. Always forget. No worries. Disclosures, uh, Jeff. Um, I had a conversation with Norm Haney last week briefly, but uh, we didn't talk about anything that's not covered in the staff report. Um, and of course, that was present at the two prior occasions in which this matter came before they were, the, the property came before the Planning Commission uh, over the years. Chris? I had a site visit with uh, Norm Haney, kind of caught the tail end of uh, Dave Wiles' visit as well. Um, didn't really learn anything beyond what's in the staff report uh, as far as this, this property goes. David? Uh, site visit with Norm, discussing things that are already in the report, uh, and Chris came towards the end of my discussion with Norm. Okay, I uh, attend, well, I was at and, and disclosed at uh, the two prior hearings. And I watched the city council discussion on the assessment district, which is, which is sort of involved in this project. Um, and I watched the appeal of a prior project, but I did not watch the, the uh, and there was nothing to watch at the coastal. Uh, I did not learn anything that's not in the staff report. Okie doke. Um, I did have a question of Lily, if I may. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to confirm, what's the nature of that communication you mentioned that had not yet been uh, distributed? Sure, it was, it's an email from Georgia Goldfarb that state, should I, it's, Pretty short. Um, I just want to read it to the record. Sure. Uh, I urge you to deny this applicant's permission to build um, the proposed building and property sit on the edge of an unstable bluff near the bottom of the Big Rock landslide. 
despite dewatering, the slide has continued to move. Um, the factor of safety of greater than 1.5 should be required, according to experts, for building to occur. Yet, according to the Bing Yen, according to Bing Yen, this area has a factor of less than 1.2. Another expert states that given the current creep, the actual factor of safety must be about 1.0. Um, permitting this property only sets the stage for a predictable disaster. If the city permits this, they should be held liable. Further, in a very high fire hazard area, no new housing should be permitted. Please do not permit this building. Thank you for that. Okay, we're going to go on to the public. Uh, I'm going to open the public meeting and the public meeting. And uh, the first team will be the applicant uh, with 15 minutes. Um, can you identify who is speaking for the applicants, please? Yes, our applicant team is Norman Haney, Fred Gaines, Jonathan Day, Mark Barrett, and John Congdon. And then we have members of the public. If you'd like me to list those now, or if you'd like me well, to wait, we can, we can do those one at a time. I just want to know who's in the 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, is the leader Norm, or is the leader John? It's oh, we'll let them decide. Uh, who wants to speak first in this group? Uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is Norm Haney, and I represent the, the applicant for the project. Um, I want to um, praise Lily for a, a great staff recommendation and a uh, discussion of the projects, the pluses, uh, with regard to the modifications. And good evening to all of you, and I hope you've had a, a happy um, a holiday. Um, I think one of the most important things is that the minor modifications associated with this project versus the one that was approved by the Planning Commission appealed uh, to the City Council and unanimously approved by the City Council, and then went to the, the Coastal Commission. Unfortunately, there was a mix up on when the request uh, for an extension was filed. Uh, some people in the staff felt that the staff had some responsibility in that. And so it went forward with the Planning Commission and went forward with the City Council. Unfortunately, the California Coastal Commission didn't feel the same way. When I say the Coastal Commission, I mean the staff of the Coastal Commission. So um, the things that, that, that I want to bring up is, number one, the only modification to the project is the pedestrian gate needs to be visually permeable, which is not an issue, uh, and a sunken, a lower uh, sunken patio area was covered um, with, with a roof that was an extension of a roof that was between 12 and 15 feet high, and that added uh, 455 square feet to the project. Basically, <clears throat> those are the only changes to the project. Um, and so, you know, Lily did a very good job. There are 40 homes uh, on the Big Rock Mesa that's within 500 feet of the subject project. And if you average those out and you compare the size of this house uh, to that average, you find that the size of this house is 35.9% larger than the average. Now, keep in mind, most of those 40 homes were built in the 60s and 70s. Um, I want to move forward at this point to slide 18. Can, um, can the staff bring that up? It's the renderings. Hmm. Um, give, a, give us one second. It's, it's slide 18. Oh, okay, there you go. Um, this is a um, rendering of the proposed house uh, and the 
this is taken from the north looking south towards the ocean. So you see the garage door, you see the lower portion of the roof, and you see what I refer to as a hump in the roof. The furthest portion of the roof that is from uh, the viewing point is sloped downward at approximately 7%, uh, so that the line of sight from people to the north uh, cannot see that portion of the house. That portion of the house is over 18 feet, but that's measured from the daylighting portion. Can we get the next uh, next rendering, 19? Here we go. So you see the lower portion of the house, it would normally be considered a basement if it didn't daylight, but it does daylight, so it is the first floor of the house. One of the important aspects associated with lowering that portion into the ground is that we are removing 890 cubic yards of soil from the site. That soil weighs approximately 1,200 tons. If you were to look at the net net uh, weight of the house, if you subtract the, the, the weight of the uh, caissons, the grade beams, the uh, slab on grade, the retaining walls, and the structure itself, you would still end up with a net reduction in the weight of the th this portion of, of the uh, Big Rock Mesa of approximately 700 tons. And that reduces the driving force. This project will benefit not to a great extent, we're talking about the entire Mesa here, but with regard to this lot, it will reduce the driving force by somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 700 tons, which is a tremendous amount. It's, it basically is 30 fire engines and you'd have to stack them four across and uh, five high, no, six high, seven high. Um, I want to move to the 22, slide 20. Well, let's, let's move to slide 20. Okay, the arrow on the lower right-hand side shows standpipe 33. Standpipe 33 was measured on October of this year for the groundwater level. Now, groundwater level appears to be, according to the licensed geotechnical engineers, an extremely important uh, element in determining the uh, stability factor of the slide. In this particular case, I'm, I'm going to move to um, slide 21. The portion that's in yellow is uh, standpipe 33, which is, I, I mentioned before, is on the property. The water level is 245 feet down. Now, that is 35 feet below sea level. It is either the lowest or amongst the lowest groundwater levels in the entire Mesa. And to lower the water level even lower than that would be near impossible. Those are my comments. And um, I think next we want to hear from... Uh, from Fred Gaines. Well, let, let's first of all hear from our geologist, um, our geotechnical engineer, um, Mark Barrett. Hi, this is Mark Barrett. Okay, Mark. Um, could, could you comment on the recent memorandum uh, from the city uh, geotechnical Department on December 23rd, 2020, and how this project uh, relates to that? Yes, so we, we've been investigating the site since 2011. We, um, we, we met all the requirements of the city for that variance and received a, uh, an approval in 2012. The current development, we provided additional reports for the, for the current development for that 
for that variance and it was approved in 2016. So all of our, um, all of our, all of our reports have been approved through that variance. And so our recommendations provide an increase in safety relative to the current conditions and previous development of the subject site, such as improving the structural elements of the proposed dwelling, new pile foundation, grading to lower the pad grade, drainage, hardscape, landscaping, and septic plans. So that, that's what I have to say right now. Okay. Uh, Fred Gaines, would you like to make a comment with regard uh, to any legal issues? Yes, thank you very much, Honorable Commissioners Fred Gaines of the Law Office of Gaines and Stacey. First of all, we do want to reserve five minutes of time uh, for rebuttal. Um, the There were two two issues that have been raised by um, some of the commenters that, that you may have seen in some of the letters. One has to do with the CEQA analysis. In this case, this is clearly an exempt project, construction of one new single-family residence. So the burden then goes on parties arguing against that. Uh, exemption to create an, to, to claim an, an exception to the exemption. The exception that's been claimed is the unusual circumstances uh, exception, but the California Supreme Court has specifically ruled uh, in the Berkeley Hillside case that even though uh, a house would be larger than other houses in the area and would be located in an area designated as a potential landslide, as long as there is a site-specific geologic study, the house is a single family residential house in a residential zone and is in field development, then the exception does not apply. The exemption for single family homes applies. The case is directly on point. Lastly, uh, in terms of legal issues, I do wanna uh, make the point that this is sort of a classic taking situation that the commission and the city find themselves in. The denial of this request for approval will result in this applicant being deprived of privileges enjoyed by others in the vicinity, including the opponents themselves, whose homes are all maintained on this exact same uh, geologic situation, this exact same landslide. Uh, so um, in order to, uh, any approval would require uh, the variance that's being requested, uh, and in order to avoid um, denying all economic use. Excuse me, uh, you um, have just a little under five minutes left if you want to do yeah, I'm going to take 10 more seconds. I saw that. Thank you, okay. uh, uh, Kathleen. Okay. Um, so to avoid the unconstitutional taking and corresponding liability for the city, there needs to be an approval uh, of a house. That adds, added to the fact, of course, in this case, that there was a house there that was fire, um, that was destroyed by fire. Uh, that's going to be the end of our comments for this section, and we'll re uh, maintain the remaining time for rebuttal. Thank you, Commissioners. Okay, do we have, an, uh, who's the first person on the public list? So we have uh, a number of speakers, uh, about 22. Um, would you like me to beat off the just next bunch of them? Yeah, or? no, just uh, bring them up as, you, as they come. Okay, Hack Wong. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. you can. You can hear me, okay? I mean, I'm not sure sometimes you cannot hear me. You can be heard. Go okay. ahead. You want me to start now? Okay. My name is Hak Wong. I'm just here to express my concern, personal concern. I mean, I would leave the technical reality to the geologist, okay? I've been here since 1996. Okay, 25 years, okay. When I first look at houses in Nalibu, my realtor would not show me any place in Big Rock. She said, this is not safe. It's very dangerous, landslide. Our agent, my agent would not show it. Well, I end up here anyway, one way or the other. And But when I sign the paper, I have a stack of disclosures or disclaimer thicker than the Malibu phone book. I said, oh my God, what did I get myself into? But then on second thought, you know, you know, you cannot predict what's going to happen, okay? Now you're entrusted with the, with the stewardship of a corner paradise. All you can do is that, do the best you can to protect it, okay? Your contract will be clear, okay? And I've been here through the years, every few years there are uh, uh, disasters. Is that natural? Well, how much you can say is, is human activity had to do with it? 
All I know is that I pay $5,500 more than that every year, every year for the big work land side assessment bond for more than 10 years, okay? I don't have, and we will have pay pretty soon okay? again, okay? And all I know is also, I'm an MD, I work late at night, okay? Sometimes past midnight. And when I do that, almost every year, Caltrain will have to block Or entire PC, okay, that's straight. So that the worker can remove the unstable boulder and the top of the hill. And then blow it down and move it to the side and then over one lane for what to move up almost every year, okay? And that's, that's, that's what I know. But now, what I guess somebody come in here and say that with the attitude like, I can do what I want because I have the money, okay? You cannot stop me. If you hassle me, you will, I will build bigger and taller, okay? But that's not how it works because we all in Big Rock has to pay for and protect the landslide, okay? We all don't have to take care of that. If somebody doesn't disregard the public safety or the PC below the statistic and the scientific studies okay he know more than I do in this sort of thing and after all I'm only a layman okay I'm only a MD okay and I can tell you This land is not pooling water, that's not drinking water. You cannot build bigger than what it was before because there's an ornament in how much you can pay with a building lot. Okay, this is what. Okay, and I leave it for my, Michael, Miss Don Michael, to, to discuss the concern about land size stability. From what I understand, it can worse. Okay, we need to uh, 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 pay for more uh, 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 upgrade of the equipment to dewater and to monitor the landslides. Okay, all right. That's all I have to say now. So next we have Ed Michael. Don Michael or Ed Michael? Oh, Ed Michael, okay. <clears throat> Can you hear us, Ed? Eugene Michael. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, it's initials E.D. Michael. My apologies. Okay, yes, we can it's hear Don Michael. E.D. Michael is Don Michael. Oh, okay. Okay, we can hear you and you can speak. It's muted. Oh, well, <clears throat> I understand you can hear me now. Is it, oh, good, you've got those on scene. Is it possible for you to, for me to show you something that uh, will be seen on your screen? No. Oh. Do I get an answer or not for that? Apparently not. Uh, apparently not. 
Uh, well, I'm t uh, t speaking for Dr. Wong, and um, some months, uh, a month ago, so ago, I contacted City Council about my concern uh, about the condition at Inland Lane. Didn't get a reply. Uh, still haven't, as a matter of fact. Uh, but in any event, later I was contacted by Dr. Wong. Uh, I've read the geoconcepts report. Apparently, geoconcepts. Uh, was working under the impression that the site had been approved before uh, for many years and therefore didn't require a geotechnical report uh, for whatever plans were uh, prepared uh, at that time. Uh, however, I'm convinced now, and if I had the uh, ability to show you my illustrations, There is evidence of an active landslide now in progress with the scarp uh, passing roughly through the inland lane cul-de-sac. Um, there is no easy way to stabilize the slope, uh, but the safety factor now uh, underlying the mass where uh, 20272 is to be uh, re rebuilt, uh, the safety factor there can't be much above 1.0. Uh, that is critical. As far as I can see, according to the picture, uh, Uh, shown on the screen here now, the only way to correct the matter is to install rock bolts uh, where, I, where, where you can see them on the diagram. Uh, it, do, it does not look possible like it, the, the material could be buttressed in any way. And the rock bolts are being put in, are proposed to be put in in that mass, which was originally uh, placed uh, in 1960, I guess it was. according to the Aramco engineers' uh, geotechnical plan. At that time, the uh, county did not, not really have a firm grasp of, of grading principles, and uh, the building code had just been uh, uh, promulgated. So it's... Not surprising that that fill probably wasn't put in as well as it should have been. In any event, uh, other than that, uh, the uh, idea, uh, perhaps Norm Cajun, Norm Haney gave you in that caissons would be uh, sufficient for support for this property is, uh, I believe, definitely incorrect. Uh, the mass, the fill mass, degree mass generally, that problem, I understand, will be discussed next month. Uh, but I want you to understand that the problem we have here at Inland Lane, which is affecting uh, oh, four houses, four properties, I guess, uh, directly, and indirectly others in the area. That is an entirely separate matter. And from the record I've read, uh, there has not been an adequate geotechnical study done uh, for this project. And it, it would be a grave mistake to think that the original approval of the grading uh, in, in the vicinity of Inland Lane uh, cul-de-sac is uh, was done adequately at that time and I believe that the reason that it's moving now is because it probably wasn't installed properly. Any questions? We can come back to that. Um... I, I want to say I don't hear as well as I used to be able to and if you have any questions please speak up. Okay uh, we would like probably like to ask you questions after we 
hear the other people. So can you stay on the line? Be glad to. Thank you. Okay, so next, you? I'm sorry. Uh, Gerhard Eide, I, I'm not sure I'm uh, pronouncing the name, but it's Gerhard. Can you hear us, Gerhard? I, I don't see them in the meeting. I don't either. Okay, can you try at the end of the meeting? Sure. And give us the next person. Uh, next one of the favor, if Gerhard can hear us, if you can raise your hand, if you're logged in as someone else, then we can at least spot you. Well, I don't know where you see this. I only see four people, so. Uh, um, we so have... let's go on. Oh, certainly. We have Joe Drummond next. Can you play, can you put Rosemary Eide on? Because that's where Gerhard is. Because they're going to play a video. Okay, can you try that? Um, they're not fully connected to the meeting. If you see, they have no audio connected, so I can't actually unmute them. They might want to try to exit the meeting and get back in. And there's a second Rosemary login. Is that, can you try unmuting that and see if that's uh, maybe a second login for them? I cannot. That sounded promising. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, now you should hear me. We uh, did. And can we confirm <laughs> this is, uh, is this the correct it's speaker? Marie. It's Rosemary. I recognize okay. her. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. My name is Rosemary Eide, and I have lived on Big Rock for 46 years in Piedra Chica and seen and experienced a few serious storms. And there will be pictures coming up. Um, Joe will show some pictures. The storms will be coming back and our only way in and out is Pacific Coast Highway, which will be closed for days and even longer. When I moved here, I was not able to see any homes from PCH. These are the homes on inland on the bluff especially uh, Roca Chica and Inland all along the bluff. It looks frightening to be so close to the bluff. Slides, <laughs> storms. The issue of landslides where houses slide down the hillside to PCH and who is liable? Is it the city? The city will be liable for promoting development on a landslide. Remember Laguna Beach in 2005. 12 homes destroyed in the landslide cost the city 35 million, would be multiple times now. In my neighborhood, one house has experienced slumping and cracking due to too much underground water or perched conditions, according to Don Michaels. We all observe the cracks inside and outside of our homes. The pump in our street, which is W3, is barely producing more than a few gallons per day. First time that I saw some water come out in almost a year was a few days ago, um, maybe even longer. Uh, how long ago that pump was pumping. And the city continues to hand out permits by the dozens. No considerations for the homeowners who have lived here for many years. Another issue is the city is not enforcing any tree view ordinance. New houses, new landscaping, and here goes the view. I do object to the project. For my safety, our safety, mm. of course not the, um, the, the owner who wants to build on it. Thank you for your time. Rosemary, is your husband going to speak? Uh, he's giving his time. I, I give him my time to call in. Well, we we can't give time during this this session. Okay. Okay. Oh, if you wish to say something, 
You've got oh, three. I'm, 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 I'm uh, just participating. Okay. Who's next? Well, Gerhard, can Gerhard, can you hear me? Can Gerhard give the time for a video? No. No? Okay. To play, to play a video, John? Oh, we'd seen that before, though. People gave uh, videos for um, uh, similar well, presentations in the past. Oh, well, if, he has, if it's his video, yes, he can he use to play it. He can minutes. just play it. Well, yeah, so, Joe Drummond. Gerhard could, yeah, if he can play it. Well, we we don't have it here. Joe has it. Oh. Has Joe submitted it? Uh, got a Joe, question. she is. It. Yes, yeah. I submitted it. It's, it's, Parker has it to play. Okay. So could could that be played uh, as as Gerhardt's submission then? Yes. Waiver, sure. Um, yes. So is it on right now? That one point five thing. All right. This will be Gerhardt's time. Right? Okay. That applies throughout the city, right? Why would you waive it in a place that's a you know a landslider? And Shires are your technical team that can better explain how the city in the past four decades has been doing reviews and the codes that are we are following. You know, um, well, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, I think that, um, you know, the factor of safety at 1.5, um, the landslide is, is never had that and it's probably never going to have that. Um, the factor safety was determined in the. Uh, I don't know if anyone can hear me, but I have a very peculiar technical difficulty. Six different areas, and so they're all different. Um, so there's been some concern expressed about, you know, some areas being lower than others. Um, you know, the the point I want to get to is that um, the code section one ten of the code allows for. Um, additions to be built, um, it allows for remodeling to be done um, within certain parameters of the code. And it really requires, um, it requires stability to be um, addressed by the geotechnical consultants um, in a manner of speaking, um, is the property safe for the intended use based on um, what's being proposed? We can't allow um, a brand new single family residence to be constructed because the factor of safety is not above 1.5. Um, these code sections were written by the county um, long before cityhood. And like I said, um, everything has been operating under these same code sections in perpetuity. Um, factor one, factor of safety 1.5 is, is in the uh, LCP, LIP, um, section 9.4. And that's really what prevents a brand new single family residence from being built in Big Rock. Um, there have been some attempts to do that and those applications have had to apply for uh, variances that end up coming before you, the city council. That is, you know, why are we, uh, if we are and how prevalent is it that we're straying from the safety factor that's you know that's what they should be following throughout. and we can but, certainly bring back an item that provides more information okay i assume that that was the city council's deliberation and just for identification uh that was a city engineer speaking I think his name was Phipps, maybe? The geologist, isn't he? Mike Phipps. Yeah, okay, geologist. So just, that's just for the record. Okay, uh, who do we have next? We have Joe Drummond next. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. 
Honorable Planning Commission, as you just watched in the video, I also asked the question McMullen asked, why are we issuing waivers and variances if 1.5 is the standard factor of safety that applies throughout the city? Why would you apply it to a place that is a landslide area? Michael Phipps from Cotton Shires, the city consulting ge geologist, stated that factor of safety of 1.5 can never be reached in the Big Rock area. We have several geologists, including Don Michael, who predicted Big Rock Mesa landslide, and Don Kowaleski, former city geologist, that acknowledges current movement in Big Rock, which makes the factor of safety closer to 1.0. This has not been adequately addressed by the city. This slide shows all the movement in Big Rock over the last 40 years, where they actually measure. Movement ranges from 0.1 to 3.5 inches during an earthquake. This shows we are at a minimum close to 1.0 stability. Michael Phipps repeats twice that we can't allow a brand new single family resident to be constructed because the factor of safety is not above 1.5. The city has been straying from the factor of safety in Big Rock with over 130,000 square foot of new construction and additions approved by the signing of assumption and risks and releases since 92 when our last slope stability testing was completed by Bing Yen. We have Don Kowalewski's two geological reports dated March 2018, where he states clearly that because the building is larger and will introduce more water into the ground, it is in violation of section 110.2.1 of the building code and will result in a lower factor of safety for this portion of the BRM landslide, thereby adversely affecting offsite properties. It is in violation of the building code because it does not have a minimum required factor of safety relative to slope stability. The applicant's geotechnical reports did not evaluate earthquake risks relative to slope stability, which are conducive to landslide, and there are several faults near the property. This project is based on an approval eight years old where the project was only one level and one did not consider the dangerously low current safety factor in Big Rock, and two was not built into the cliffside. No home has ever been built in the cliffside of the bluffs along BCH and Big Rock. It is proven not to be safe by all experts including our own consulting geologists. The problem of the lower factor of safety, despite the dewatering efforts, is confirmed by geologist Lawson in the massive litigation Malibu landslide document after an extensive study of the area that dewatering alone probably cannot stabilize the steep bluffs along PCH. Yay and Associates presented that our water levels are low, comparing them to 1983 and 91 levels. However, they didn't account for the drought over the last 20 years. Water levels have risen in the Eastern Mesa area last year and are only 15 feet from the highest ele ever ele recorded elevation. Don Kowalewski states that the applicant's geologist did not use correct safety factor calculations and the findings should be much lower than the 1.37 calculated. Regardless, it can never meet the 1.5 factor of safety allowed and therefore should be denied. We must let the experts, the community and the city council deliberate this at the forum they will have on development and factor of safety in Big Rock scheduled so far for February 22nd. So this item should be denied or continued until after that date. Thanks very much. Okay, so next we have, um, looks like Colin Drummond. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great, thank you. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. I'm speaking on behalf of Christopher Cunningham. I request that the Planning Commission discontinue issuing variances to the 1.5 factor of safety requirement for this project and also for any other development projects that could increase groundwater and destabilize Big Rock Mesa. From discussions and testimony in past city meetings, including those seen in tonight's videos, it's evident that there is little clear, consistent understanding among city officials regarding the state of slope safety in Big Rock Mesa. What is clear is that testimony which planning commissioners have heard from geotechnical experts, Don Kowaleski and Edie Michael, as well as the latest comprehensive geotechnical assessment of Big Rock Mesa, the 1991 Binyan Report, all state the factors of safety in Big Rock Mesa are at or below 1.2 in most regions and are closer to 1.0 all factors of safety well below the 1.5 requirement. Yet there are conflicting findings on, on whether future development projects are safe or detrimental to property owners or neighboring properties. During the prior video, it's clear that the city officials remain fairly uninformed and confused on the matter and continue to ask similar questions showing a lack of clear understanding. This Inland Lane project is the latest example of experts and city officials having conflicting claims providing a pro providing a, regarding a project safety. 
Two licensed geologists, Don Kowalewski and Edie Michael, both disagree with key findings of the licensed geologist geoconcepts hired by the developer. Kowalewski provided a signed 2018 memo justifying, quote, rejection of the pros proposed project on the basis of unsafe geologic conditions, failure to conform with current city policy and codes, failure to conform with state law regarding earthquake-induced hazards, and mis misrepresentation of the project, unquote. Reviewing essentially the same information, Kowalewski, who's a former Malibu city geologist, and the current city geologist and geotechnical staff arrive at opposite conclusions. Kowalewski's points contradict both GeoConcept's findings as well as those of the city's resolution that claims the granting of a variance will not be detrimental to public interest, safety, health, or welfare, or detrimental or injurious to properties in the vicinity. Given points I have raised in Kowalewski's memo statements that Eric Sosa will read next, there's ample grounds for continuance and causing the is issuance of variances to the factor of safety requirement until further information and facts are clearly understood by city officials, geotechnical experts, and big rock property owners. And I urge, and I urge you to do so. The city council is apparently gonna meet about this in February. This will be a great opportunity to gather all parties for a productive, more objective, informative discussion and to establish a common foundation from which we can move forward. Thank you. Next we have, uh, looks like Dean Wilcox. I'm here. Hello, I'm Dean. I uh, waved my time for Abrams video. Arnold. Arnold Abrams video. Thank you. I just want to make sure I heard you right. No specific slope stability was done for this property, right? That's correct. Okay. It was not required by the city geologist and I did not do it. Okay. And you said that no additions can be added below 1.25. That's correct. Okay. So you said the whole, I think Mr. Michael said the whole neighborhood was under 1.25. He felt that it might be around 1.0. And honestly, no one's done it. Logically, when a land mass moves some, it has to have a safety factor around 1.0 or less. And if you look at the slope inclinometers that the cities or that was installed that the city is monitoring, they do show a quarter of an inch a year on some years. And during the, um, actually not a quarter inch, less than that, it's 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Um, during the Northridge earthquake, it moved about 0.5 inches, okay? All of that would suggest the safety factor is low. <clears throat> However, when this first came out, and I was this geologist for the city at the time, and I was wondering, how can they say it's a 1.25 when, in fact, we see there's some evidence of movement, especially during earthquakes? And I was told by the geotechnical engineer with Bingen and Associates, that's just the way it works. Beats me, all right? So I can understand why Mr. Michael is saying it's 1.0. And this I know it is a big issue on a piece of property that is of concern to a lot of people. And you would, I would have, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm naive in this stuff, but I would have expected that the city would have wanted to wait in in terms of what they think. I'm just surprised that's not there, but we'll come back to that later. Can okay. I, I'll ask a question just to follow up that what was already said about. I don't know if we call it variously the slope stability index or the factor of safety, that normally that's supposed to be 1.5 and there was an allowance made at some point back in the past that in Big Rock it could be 1.25. And I understand that we're allowing less than that because they're signing waivers saying, yeah, I, I understand there's a risk here I want to build anyway. But my question would be, how low is too low on those waivers? If we came back hypothetically and somebody found that the stability index was 1.01, .01, this thing was right on the edge of movement, would you still say, yeah, we'll sign, we'll, we'll let them just sign that waiver? You know, at, at, at what point does, the, does that waiver process become too risky 
And do we even know what the stability index is there right now? I don't think we have a number for that that's at all current. The exact number, but I believe there are certain variances that take place for anything, um, for the factor of safety, if that's at a certain lower point. I have to get that exact number. I don't have that off the top of my head, but there are certain variances that are asked for and granted for that. So next, um, looks like we have Eric Sosa. Hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Good evening, commissioners. I also urge you to cease issuing variances to the factor of safety requirements for this project and others until more information can be evaluated. Former Malibu City geologist Don Kalor. Kolowski states in his 2018 memo his justification for rejecting this inland lane project. He states, in quotes, even though GeoConcepts repeatedly states that there will be no adverse effect on all site properties, the introduction of water into the ground will decrease stability of the Big Rock Mesa landslide and decrease stability of all site properties. GeoConcepts' opinions are simply opinions not based on fact, nor data, not calculations. Their opinion in regarding the effect on offsite properties is erroneous." End of quote. He continues, quote, the GeoConcepts report did provide static stability analysis with a safety factor of 1.37 that did not consider earthquake forces. There appears to be several problems with that stability analysis. All would suggest the safety factor should be less. End of quote. He points out, quote, the report does not state the site will be safe from geological hazards. Geoconcepts recognize that all, not all data was known and provides numerous disclaimers. However, they repeatedly state the project will not adversely affect off-site properties. They do not have the data to justify those statements. As required by city policy, findings regarding safety Site safety must be based on data and analysis." End of quote. He cites many examples of geoconcepts lack of data or misinterpretation of data and lists many reasons why their site stability evaluation is flawed. Then he states, in quote, reports for proposed development in a map hazard zone are required by state law to evaluate the risk from earthquake-induced landslide and provide recommendations to mitigate this risk. Malibu guidelines also require seismic pseudostatic slope stability analysis. No analysis of the stability of the site were performed considering earthquake forces. Therefore, the project is in violation of both state law and city codes. He goes on to say, quote, one must question the logic in allowing a new structure that will add additional water into the ground when we already see an acceleration in the rate of landslide movement with a rise in groundwater, end of quote. Finally, he concludes the project cannot be legally permitted under current building codes for reasons including insufficient geotechnical information to accu accurately determine the actual safety risk. And the city would violate state law to approve a new dwelling in a mapped earthquake-induced landslide hazard zone without requiring evaluation and mitigation according to the state law and codes. Excuse also, me, um, that's your time? How can one former Malibu city geolog geologist and current city geologist and geotechnical staff arrive at such contradictory findings after viewing essentially the same information? Again, I ask you that you stop issuing variances. Thank you. Um, next have Dee Dee Graves. Are you there, Didi? They don't seem to be answering my ask time. Okay. Do we want to move on to the next person then? 
Yeah, I'm keep, back. Keep her name on the list. Okay. Right at the end. I'm mute. I'm here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, Honorable Planning Commissioners, Happy New Year. Hopefully next year is going to be better than this last. I live at 20224 Pacific Coast Highway. I'm probably the only speaker living below the prop the proposed development on Inland Lane. The house next to mine was destroyed during the 1984 Big Rock Mesa landslide. We're on the highway, under the mesa, at the toe of the Big Rock slide. The 1.5 factor of standard safety should be a no-brainer. Any development needs to meet with the standard of slope stability. Codes have been developed for the safety of our lives and property. Why are they constantly being ignored and variances being given? Agreeing to variances undermine the safety of our community and not only mention the effects on Pacific Coast Highway. This application is just west of Big Rock Mesa landslide area. If a slide is generated from any land movement, my house and five or six others will be destroyed and Pacific Coast Highway could be closed indefinitely. I have to thank Dr. Wong for sharing information so that we were aware of what's happening up on the Mesa and thank Joe Drummond for her unbelievable time and effort in involving the safety of our community. Thank you. Next we have uh, Georgia Goldfarb. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Um, it, this, most of this was read before, but uh, let me just look for it. Um, I urge you to deny the applicant's permission to build. In regard to the negative character, I would like to point out that that is established by existing building and habitat, not someone's future fantasy of what it might be. Um, whether the uh, proposed building and property sit on the edge of an unstable bluff near the bottom of the big rock landslide. Despite the blurry, the slide is becoming smooth. A safety factor for the meaning of the new year is the 1.5 of the meaning of the We're having trouble hearing anything. Yeah, could you speak up a little bit? Okay, I don't know where you lost me. The whole thing? No. Yeah, uh, we didn't miss much. Oh, okay. The safety factor of equal to or greater than 1.5 should be. Can you hear me now? Is this okay? Yes. Okay. Um, as a factor of, uh, sorry, uh, for building to occur. Yet, according to Bin Yang, this area has a factor of equal or less than 1.2. Another expert states that given the current creep, the actual factor of safety may be about one. Um, in terms of the hypothesis that replacement of this great amount of earth with a building, uh, I would suggest and that that would make the slide more stable. I would suggest that is truly probably not going to be borne out with scientific discovery. Uh, you simply can't state that you just because you have less weight, the slide will be more stable. This is going to involve a gross disruption of the structure of the land mass, and I would suggest that by itself, that may destabilize this, this slide. So um, I would say permitting this property only sets a stage for a predictable disaster. If the city permits this, they should be held liable. Um, I would also like to say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Please do not remove this building. Thank you. So next we have uh, Joanne Gorby. Are we seeing Joanne? Oh. I don't see her in the meeting. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. We next have 
Kushang Vahedi. I, I don't see them either. Okay. Uh, then we have Jeff Greer. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. you can. All right, here we go. I'm not a geologist, nor do I know of any living in my community. But many of us in Big Rock have been forced to become students of geology out of concerns regarding the questionable quality of the monitoring and maintenance of our MESA. Simply stated, we live in an active landslide. We have a mitigation system that is old and of dubious effect. We have accumulated varying geologic reports and opinions as to the current and future landslide risks. What we want to know is quite simple and in simple language. What are those risks now? What are the potential outcomes? What are the best and worst case scenarios? And what can be done to arrest or avoid a negative outcome? I'm pleased to know there is a special city hall meeting being scheduled. I would hope this would be a closed meeting involving geologists, city council, and Big Rock residents. I believe that the parties involved in this construction right now would be very interested in knowing outcomes because it affects their property as well as the rest of ours. After the landslide of 1983, some of our someone or a group of someone's deemed it safe to begin new construction up here. Now, decades later, we want to know where we stand. Thank you. Next, we have Joy Wilcox. Are we seeing Joy in the meeting? I do not. Okay. Did we want to circle back to the other two people, or are they still not in the meeting? Joanne Corby and Hushang Bahidi? Alex, are they here? It doesn't look like they are, no. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm going to close the public meeting. Oh, there's a number of other people, I'm sorry, um, that oh. still have signed up. I, I apologize. Um, we have next... Um, Rebecca Halliday Congdon. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. She's not here quite yet. Can can I wait for one minute for her? You can call somebody else and I'll make sure she gets here within five minutes. John? Yes, this is John. No, I'm talking to John. Uh, John Mazza. We, uh, maybe I'm the only one anybody can hear. Kathleen, yeah. I think we just, just put a pen here. Yeah. Move on to the next speaker. Okay. Anna Patula. Are we seeing Ina Patula? Hello? Yes, is this? I have Jimmy Patula signed up as next. Are we going to Jimmy? Chair Maza, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. My name is Jimmy here. Uh, I think that was Jimmy who. Yeah, I just um, heard him. We you had Ina, Ina Patula first, but I didn't yeah. hear her. Yes, this is Jimmy. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah, there I apologize. I think I think Ina. We were all trying to figure out how to sign up, so we, we did. We both did need to talk. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I've been on, I've been out here for thirty years myself, uh, and. Uh, you know, I've, I just, I, I have a kind of a different view of this. I mean, John is trying to build a, a house for his family and, you know, he bought the lot that was permitted to build and he actually is 
most of the people that I've heard that are, that are complaining about it are are mostly, I think, because it's obstructing their their view, frankly. Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, we got with all due respect, you know, like Dr. Wong, we've had I've had the fire department out here, you know, twice a year and won't trim anything, not worried about the fires. Uh, we, we repaved our street on, on, on uh, Big Rock and, uh, I mean, on Inland Lane and, and uh, couldn't get people to pitch in with that, which can, which can help for everything. So I don't know. I just, I think that it's a, a thing where uh, I, don't, I don't see any problem. I mean, I've, I've been here, I put a marker on my property. I have a, a, the big hill and put a marker when I first got here, there was no fence going down to the drop. And I certainly haven't seen any kind of movement or anything as long as I've been here. And I just think that, you know, he's, uh, he should be allowed to, 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 to put his place together. And if, you know, the, the way that, that John had positioned it, he was trying to make it even better for people to not obstruct their view. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, he should be allowed to, to do his project. I think if any of us, spent millions of dollars for a lot that was permitted to build and suddenly we have neighbors that don't want it to be to be built uh i mean we get complaints all the time here that you know uh, uh we're we're we're, uh, we're putting a new mailbox in and we get a notice saying big rock we're complaining big big rock's gonna fall off the hill i mean i think we all have uh we all have those two or three neighbors that no matter what you do, they're going to say no, and they're going to complain, and they're going to call the city when they hear a hammer. So I think that he should be allowed to do the project. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jared Cohen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good evening. Thank you, guys. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Jared Cohen. I live uh, on the neighboring property to the applicant uh, to the west. We've lived on Inland Lane for about 10 years and have known the applicant, uh, John Becca, and, and his young daughter for about that same amount of time. Um, first, I'd like to say that I think John and Becca have really been above board in everything throughout this whole process have been overly compliant, overly transparent, and overly respectable in reaching out to neighbors and trying to make sure that uh, this process would go as smoothly and address the concerns of everyone in the neighborhood. There's two things I wanna mention specifically about this project that I think are the most important from my family's perspective. You know, I, as I said, I live directly to the west of the property. I have three young kids. And the most important thing to me here is safety. I've gone through the findings of the licensed geologist, and I would not bless anything unless I believe that 100% of the safety projections in this report are factual. I take comfort in the report that water levels are at lower levels than they have ever been. I take comfort that this project actually results in less weight uh, and less downward force on the MESA. And I think the safety points uh, are abundantly clear and I would not support anything if I did not believe that to be the case. I also believe that this project is very beneficial to the neighborhood with respect to neighborhood standards and neighborhood impacts. It results in less of a view impact than the property that was already originally improved, approved. And the build out and the high end finishes and features will provide a positive uh, data point to our neighborhood and positive impact on valuations ultimately for all of our homes here. Net net, I'm excited about the project. I believe that the applicant has done the appropriate diligence and has answered all the questions with respect to safety. And we do support uh, the applicant in the building of this project. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Nora Cohen. Nora actually is, uh, I spoke for, Nora's my wife, so she is not joining as well. Okay. Um, it seems that we have um, 
a couple people that are, have joined the meeting. Um, Chair, do you want to wait until the end to see if we can circle back to them? Sure, let's try. Do we have any more? We have um, Miriam Akbar and Craig Hill, and then we have a couple people that we weren't able to reach before. Okay, uh, let's let's try the, the two now, and the two are in line, and then we'll squeeze the other two in. Certainly. Miriam Akbar. Um, hi, this is uh, Reza Nababi and Miriam Akbar. She's my wife. Um, and so we're, we're both here together, and we're just going to share, share our time together. So we, we've been residents of Big Rock Mesa, um, live on Pedro Chico Road, which is just one street of the applicant. Um, and, you know, we, we love it here. Uh, we definitely purchased the home with the idea of being here forever. Um, as I often say, where, you know, where would we want to move? Big Rock is truly a slice of heaven. I, um, John's one of our neighbors we've gotten to know as well, as well as Jared and countless other neighbors. And, um, you know, I got to say, we, we've taken considerable time to look at all of the reports and assessments and all of the background. We actually went through everything and everything sounds reasonable. Um, one thing that wasn't mentioned is that, you know, in terms of safety, I, I, I would think that John, uh, more than anybody, would want to ensure the safety of the home because that's, that's where he lives. And so we can trust his intentions are pure. Um, as far as some of the opposition, you know, um, I question a lot of uh, the motives. Um, it was mentioned earlier about, you know, concerns around views. Of course, you're, you know, you're not going to hear about that being a primary uh, concern because it would be difficult to rally support around one's views. So it's, you've got to make about all this other stuff. You know, the, the hill is falling down. Things are unsafe watering even even if there's reports and data that don't support that um those are ignored and instead you know this sort of propaganda continues to be perpetuated and it really makes me sad i actually um we've been impacted too negatively by some of the same opposition that spoke tonight that we just continue to hear them and we dealt with the same same exact things we were here before the planning commission over a year ago who, um, you know, approved our project on Piedra Chica and, um, you know, which we just waited and waited and waited for years for a very straightforward project with no variances, no exceptions, no provisions, nothing. And the commission approves and here we are waiting because our neighbors, who so again, it's really about their views, which they've admitted, but, you know, they're, you know, they of course appealed it and here we are waiting for the appeal hearing, it's just you know, it's not right. You know, it's not fair. I think um, I, I think that we really need to look at the data and look at all the time that's been spent by your staff and everyone in the city of Malibu, and trust those findings. Trust the Yale and Associates report that just came out, which shows that not only are the water levels not what the opposition says they are, but they're actually lower than they've ever been. Let's let's look at that and let's. You know, let's let John build. Let's let anybody who's doing their due diligence and who's a responsible homeowner, let them build because that's their right. And they've invested considerable time to making their home safe as well as the whole neighborhood. Frankly, I wish other neighbors would follow um, some of the same safety protocols that um, John has incorporated in his project. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Craig Hill. Oh, good evening. Uh, pretty house, Norm. I'm over half a mile to the west, no view at stake. Personally, I'm interested in limiting groundwater, but I'd also like the option to remodel someday. With so many unknowns, I can't have too definite an opinion. So my comments are more in the nature of observations than advocacy. That said, it would be prudent to continue this until the council is weighed in on the dewatering district, et cetera. But here we have dueling geologists that yet they all agree that the stability factor can never be sufficient. The applicant's attorney states that there's no evidence of hazard, yet the dewatering district itself is predicated on evidence, legally ratified in the lawsuit in the 80s, that more water in the hill means more hazard. 
Also, the staff report notes that with expansive soils, deflection and cracking cannot be eliminated. This expected damage has not been documented as having been waived by any other properties in the vicinity. So the city provides what they prefer to call an assumption of risk and release form for which waiver is the shorthand. That system exposes other homeowners, innocent third parties to unwarranted risk for which the city would be ultimately have liability. Consider the liability issues faced in Laguna with the Bluebird Canyon site in 2005. At the scale of Big Rock, Malibu's liability could run hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, instead, we should change the code to better address groundwater issues in slide areas. Only the 1968 house has precedential relevance. Nothing else stands as approved because Coastal signaled a denial of the previous application leading to its withdrawal. This project represents more environmental impact than the 68 house in having likely 60% more fixtures. In my memo, I pointed out 17 reasons this should be continued until after council action. Many are about missing data. For the variance with respect to any special privilege not enjoyed by others in the vicinity, you'd want to compare the number of fixtures with the number in houses in the vicinity in terms of relative impact on groundwater. You don't have that data. For your site plan review, staff states the habitable square footage is 3,347, yet when you subtract from total TDSF, the garage, storage, cabana, and covered areas, you get 3,792 habitable. That's 13% greater than staff's number. And here, the habitable area is 36% higher, as, as Norm said, than the average of 14 other houses and substantially larger than all but one. Much of the bluff below the house site appears to be ESHA. Some of the drainage features on sheet A2 are listed for future design. Those shouldn't be TBD in this tenuous context. The geo review sheet calls this a burnout. Legally, it's not. Can we confirm that no departmental approvals relied on that? Uh, the net lot area is incorrectly reported on sheet A00. Staff caught the error elsewhere, but can you be sure it wasn't propagated into other calculations by various city departments or outside consultants? Finally, if it came down to a taking, Remember, you could avoid that by permitting an 800 square foot house with minimal impact. Thanks. We have one person that I believe had trouble signing up. I want to check maybe if she wants to speak. Marina Manavsky. Yes. Hello. Hello? Yeah, I'm going to speak for Marina Manavsky. This is Edward Manavsky. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, I I agree with most people that live on, on our street. And, uh, we live directly where uh, John's neighbor to the east. Um, and uh, we bought a house about seven years ago. We had a geological uh, report done, a few of them actually. And I don't see that it is a big problem for what he's trying to do. And I think most people that oppose him, it's all about the view. And they are not even, uh, they're not even on our street. Most of the people that oppose them, except uh, Hawk, uh, it's, cool. it, it's, yeah, it's also for the view, but uh, Hawk lives on the street. Everybody else who are opposing live on the next street up. So street would be to the north. So anyway, I, I'm for John building because at some point, I would probably want to expect my lot as well. And I don't want to have the Malibu City Council pass a, pass a restrictive, uh, you know, some, some kind of restrictions so I can build when I want to remodel my house. Awesome. Yeah. But in fact, uh, you know, it, it is almost to the point where these, these neighbors, uh, like Joe Drummond and uh, a, f a few people that have spoken, they're pretty much harassing people about the trees and trimming the trees and uh, doing just just ridiculous things that they want us to do. Uh, and like I said, they live pretty far away from us. They live over a thousand feet above us. So I, I don't know. Uh, I just I just want to say that I am for more building. Thank you. So, Chair, that was the last person, except for the three that we weren't able to reach. If you'd like me to try to see if they are available now. Well, I'll take a real, have Alex take a quick look to see if they're here. Okay. If not, we'll close there. 
Uh, Alex, are you we, seeing? We still have our rebuttal, Chair Mazza. Oh, you're right. Sorry. I, I get, it's going on too long. <laughs> so, Joanne. Is anything, Alex? Um, I'm referring to Joanne Gorby and Joy Wilcox and uh, Hushang Bahide. If Kathleen just called your name, please click the raise your hand button. Let's let's just start with Joy. I Are you see her? See Joy. Okay. I'll go with Joy. Honorable Planning Commissioners, um, my name is Joy Wilcox. I've lived in Big Rock for eleven years. Um, and although we've updated our home, we've never gone beyond the original footprint or have made any additions to our home. We've always been considerate of our neighbors' safety and views. This new build should not be permitted in Big Rock for several reasons, but mainly because it cannot reach the factor of safety of 1.5 required in the building codes. New builds are not allowed in Big Rock because of the active landslide. Our dewatering system can only handle a certain amount of homes, and frankly, we are way over the limit of the homes here. That's what caused the first landslide here. Septic systems increase the groundwater levels, which in turn reduce the stability of the hill. So introducing more groundwater water will reduce the factor of safety further. Our CCNRs do not allow cliffside builds. Setbacks need to be at least 15 feet from the rear property line. Also, we are limited to home heights of 15 feet, and this home reaching 24 feet is way out of that range. Our CCNRs are the standards of neighborhood character and should guide the city planning department on their codes. This build has red flags all over it with three variances requests. All of our homes were built before the 1.5 factor safety standard was put in place. The applicant should have known that he could never build a new home here and not put forth these plans. There have been too many builds in Big Rock that have made us more unstable. That is why the code was put in place and must be adhered to. The cumulative effect of this build on the area with its added water and mass to the hill would be negative for our landslide area. Please protect our community and our little piece of paradise here in Big Rock and do not approve this build. Thank you. Okay, so are, do we have Joanne Gorby, Alex? I do not see her. Okay, and then Hu Shang of Bahiti? Yes, Maybe. hold on. Okay, super. Good evening. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. I am Hu Shang Bahiti. I am living in Big Rock 20218 Piedra Chica Road. And I don't want to take you guys' time. I am agree with Joe and Colin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we, so we have all the speakers that signed up and now we're back to Norm. That is the case, yes. Okay, Norm, your your crew is back on. I think you had four minutes and 50 seconds, something like that. Yes, let me grab that. Um, yeah, actually, um, the people that were showing the videos in the beginning, Don Michaels, he took four and a half minutes, and Wong Hack took five minutes, and several others took up to one minute over their three minutes. Uh, so we're going to have, Norm, we're going to have time to question the experts, but we're going to keep to the regular procedure. Uh, use your time, and I'm sure we have some questions for you. All right. Well, first of all, <clears throat> there is confusion about the level of safety that is uh, required for building in Big Rock. And as a consequence, Michael Phipps, uh, Christopher Dean, and Lauren Doyle wrote a memorandum to make that clear as that there was a difference in how you apply the safety factors. Under the first paragraph, it says in California and locally adopted building code and the local coastal program, and local implementation plan, there is a distinction between constructed properties, that is properties uh, with existing previously permitted structures and new property construction, properties where no structure has ever been previously permitted. That's an important distinction. We are in a situation where we have a constructed property, properties that had permitted structures on it. 
Then under point three, it says the term waiver is a misdemeanor is a misnomer. The city utilizes assumption and risk and release form that's recorded, basically a recorded document when development is permitted by a building code in areas with known geologic hazard, including those potentially subject to hazard from landslide, settlement, or slippage. The underlying requirements of the assumption of risk and release and the building code are that the applicants, California state licensed professionals, a certified engineering geologist and licensed civil engineer or geotechnical engineer must provide findings that conclude that the proposed development is safe for the intended use and does not pose a risk to the neighboring properties. Now, geo concepts uh, are professional geotechnical engineers and they have made that statement uh, in their statement on December 31st, 2020. They've been working on this project or this, this particular lot for the past 10 years and have made that very same statement that, that the development of the proposed project will have a negative impact, will have no negative impact on the adjacent properties and uh, will be safe for its intended use, which is a single family home. Now, everybody else in the area, everybody else in Big Rock, some 200 plus people, and everybody else along the ocean, some 100 are on the Big Rock Mesa landslide and they all enjoy their house. They, they, they come out and, and they say negative things about the standard of safety. But the fact of the matter is, if it was that dangerous and that hazardous, why are they allowed to occupy their homes? Okay, I, uh, okay I'm gonna let John Condon uh, speak, uh, let, but, but uh, transfer over to John. And I think that Fred Gaines would like to make a, a, a one sentence or two sentence statement. John, are you on? Yes, I'm on and I'm a registered speaker. So we still have a minute and a half left that show on your uh, speaker thing. And also my wife, Becca, who also registered was not recognized again. So uh, you're not a registered speaker. You're part of the uh, Norm's group, and so you can't you can't have too much. I, I registered today. <laughs> Very clearly, Kathleen. Now, let me, now let's stop the clock here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you cannot be a public speaker and an appellant. You are an appellant. He's an applicant. It's applicant. So you have you Kathleen have your, told me that I wasn't named and that I had to register as a regular speaker today. Well, that's incorrect. You get to speak on this point. Uh, so since we. Need to clear that up. Uh, can you add one minute to this, uh, Kathy? One minute to this uh, uh, group's time, and that'll give. All right, I appreciate time that. To, uh, talk. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the rules weren't clearly outlined, but that's okay. Um, I, I just wanted to start by saying we've been working on building a safe home for our family for a long time. We have a four-year-old girl. We've done everything that has been asked of us. Every single regulation, every single time somebody asks us from the city, everything we have done to make it as safe as possible and actually reduce views for our neighbors. It was fought from the very beginning by our neighbor Hawk Wong across the street because he didn't want views or anything that would obstruct his view in any way because a house burned down before. Since then, he gained, the gang, he gained a gang of warriors, including Joe Drummond and Colin Drummond, who don't want a house built on their street. And everybody joined together and said, hey, if you fight the house on Inland, we'll fight the house up on Piedra Chica. And they joined together. And then, as you can tell by tonight, by the talking points, every single person was given their talking points on what to say by the people who were leading that charge. I've done everything I was supposed to do. I've made as how as safe a plan as I could possibly do. 
we went down into the hill to increase safety to make a safer structure around where we dig in, reduce over 70 tons, including the added weight of the house of downward force to make the home safer. We paid double what anybody else paid other than Marina and Edward, who also spoke on in the lane to repave our private road to make it safer for water runoff and increase the safety of our of our home. While Hawk Wong, who claims he cares about safety, paid not one dime for the repaving of that street. This is a cynical attempt to stop homes that are going to decrease people's views, not a cohesive movement of people who think that the hill is less safe other than the people who have been convinced through fear, intimidation, and lack of science that somehow this particular house and other houses are not safe. It's a cynical attempt to use the system to stop us. And we've been trying to get this done for a long time and done everything we could, as Jared and Jimmy and everybody else said, to reduce view impact on our neighbors and actually create something that will be safer than an empty lot sitting there soaking up water every single time it rains. Yeah, thank you. I uh, thank you. I thank you for your time. Chair, I'm, I apologize, but it's been brought to my attention that there was an additional speaker that hadn't been called who signed oh, up. Rebecca. Rebecca. Were, were they signed up uh, prior to the meeting? Um, yes. I thought I had called them, but perhaps I did not. It was Doreen okay. um, Shiro. They have, then they can speak. It, Chair Maza, if I could recommend, if you're going to let them speak, maybe give a, a brief chance for a rebuttal to the applicants since they didn't get a rebut, whatever was said here. I'll hear what they say and see if there's anything to be rebutted. Uh, may we have them speak? Marina? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. A little echoey, but. Give me a second. I've got to turn my other iPad off because I'm having a hard time joining. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Hi, I'm Doreen Shiro. I am directly behind John Condon. Um, when we bought this house, we bought it for the view. And um, let's see. Okay, I'm in real estate, and um, Sabrina, help me. Sabrina. Sabrina. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Just give me a second because I'm hearing an echo on the other side. We don't hear an echo, so Sabrina, you can keep speaking. Hi, I'm Sabrina. I'm the sister. Um, so we bought this house for our mom, obviously 25 years ago. Our mom loves this view obviously it impacts our view completely we have relied on the ccnrs that state 15 feet we bought the house for a view we've done so much renovations to the yard and to give her a view for us to enjoy it and now we feel like we're going to be impacted we're actually the one of the few people that will be impacted with the view and not only that um, the city of malibu also took photos for the primary view. for the primary as a primary view but we don't understand how one home can put everyone our homes the big rock sunset mesa landslide homes in danger this is mal but we're so upset about this actually because we we heard other people speak and they are not impacted on the view they're not impacted we we are directly above and this home higher. and this project so you know our mom is here she's 84 years old and it does affect us. It does upset us drastically. We're all in real estate. A million dollars at least will be um, affected at our, our, on our property. And um, I don't know what else to say other than- The city came to our house. Yeah, okay. <laughs> My sister's talking to me. So the city of Malibu came to our house. They took pictures as a primary view. We don't understand how one home can put everyone, our home, our Big Rock Sunset Mesa landslide homes in danger. This is Malibu. We are notoriously known for landslides and it's just upsetting us 
immensely. People are talking about, neighbors are talking about, you know, senseless things because they don't actually, are not affected by the views. We are above it. Anything could happen. Landsides could happen. Any, you know, geologists can say all kinds of things, but the reality is this is Malibu and landslides do happen. And um, we're not only affected by the view, but we're affected by the reality the of yeah. landslides, the real estate, you know, our view, we bought this house for the view and now it's gonna be gone completely. It's not only, we relied on the CCNRs when we being bought the 15 house. feet. Now you wanna go higher. Yeah. And it's upsetting to hear neighbors that are opposing it. We understand the, that they want the view, they want the house to be a family home. But the reality is, is that it's putting a lot of people in danger and it's allowing, and, 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 it's, and it's not only that, it's also uh, permitting us not to have a view. And we are the actual people that are actually behind it that actually do not, um, are, are the ones who can say Excuse something. Me, that, that's your time? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Norm, you have uh, one minute to rebut the view issue only. Okay, with regard to the view issue, John, and uh, fellow uh, planning commissioners, uh, the, the project does meet the city of Malibu's uh, development standards with respect uh, to views. No portion of the property uh, that the, the house that is higher than 18 feet can be seen uh, as a result of the portion of the property that is 18 feet. Actually, the highest portion of the house is 17.7 feet above the adjacent ground or finished ground, whichever is lower. That portion, which is higher than 18 feet, cannot be seen by anybody. So with regard to the view shed, yes, she will lose some of her views. I saw the, the uh, uh, photographs shown, but she doesn't lose all of her views. She has a substantial amount of her ocean views left. And the city has a long history of, of not uh, following the CCNRs for a particular area. That's something that is left up to the homeowners association. The city follows its own development standards. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That will close the public hearing. Uh, we'll go back to the uh, council table for questions. Uh, question anybody in the audience or any staff member. Do we have anybody with particular questions right now? Chair Mazza, if I may jump in for just a moment, I want to let you know that our public works director is also available uh, should you have questions directed towards him. Okay, and uh, Jeff wants to talk. Yeah, let me, uh, let me ask um, Trevor. There's been a lot of discussion about the the factor of safety that's spe specified in the LIP and apparently also specified in the um, uh, in the building code, state building code. And um, my impression is that that our job is to to you know we have an application here for a coastal development permit. We're supposed to apply the the uh, LIP. But what's the the relationship between the LIP's factor of safety? and the building code uh, and it may not be trevor who could answer this i don't maybe it's it's another staff member but I'm, that's my question what what relevance does the state building code have to our deliberation here that's good, not really going to come into play into the deliberation you're making here this state building code um, issues are usually going to come up with with a remodel type situation here what you're looking at is you know whether the, the variance findings can be made here um, for a, a home that can't meet the factor of safety that's otherwise required. So that's that's the question here before the, the commission. Can I ask you a question on that, Trevor? I thought we had it always on all our findings, we had to find that it, it followed the municipal code and the state building code. Um, why wouldn't this, why would this project be different? They're requesting a variance here for it uh, to be to have an adjustment to the factor of safety here. If, I mean, if you, the building code questions, you know, that's something that this commission doesn't 
doesn't deal with. If you, you know, that's something that we have experts, we have Yolanda here to weigh in on. And if you want her to give a detailed opinion about the compliance with the building code on this project, you know, she can do that. Um, but that that's her role. It takes a lot of study and specific and, uh, you know, certification to, you know, deal with those issues. Okay. Jeff, do you have something else? Uh, not right now. Okay. Um, Anybody else? I've got some. Yeah, I, I what I did want to address to um, uh, the project geologist, there was um, some statements made about, uh, I guess it's called perched water coming from the, um, the septic system. Um, and a comment that that had not been taken uh, into account in the kind of studies that were done for this project. Um, could the project geologist talk to that, that a bit just to uh, clarify um, how that um, septic system was accounted for in the, in the analysis? And Norm, I believe that's he's part of your team there. Yeah, it, it is part of my team. I don't know, Mark. If you're around, you you need to uh, you need to join the conversation here. Okay. Yeah, they're just they just let me. Can you hear me, Chris? Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So we we drilled we drilled four borings on there on the uh, on the site and didn't and didn't find uh, any any perch groundwater. We didn't um, have that as an issue on the project. Can I ask you what what time of the year you did that? I have to look it up. We had we we drilled um, on two or three different occasions, so I'm not 100 percent sure on that. And the comments related to um, uh, the impact of the introduction of a septic system, uh, in terms of your opinion on that 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 impact to the site, right? How, how would that how would that impact it then? Well, sure, because the groundwater is so deep, right? And then the uh, the percolation rate that we had in the in the testing, the, the water is going to go down to the groundwater, and it's the, the amount of water that's going to be going in that system with respect to the whole the whole groundwater basin, so to speak, is not going to change it significantly. There's not that much water that's going to be going with respect to the the uh, the regional water um, for that landslide. Can I ask Thanks. you a question, Mark? This is John. Sure. Uh, in driving down Coast Highway and in some of the other studies I've seen, you see lensing on the side of the hill. Uh, are you saying that all the groundwater perched straight down or are there uh, barriers in between? Well, I think what you're seeing there, John, maybe um, when are you seeing it? Because is, is it after a rain event where, where it's on the slope and then maybe it's coming down the, the slope um, no, at a lower, see, lower lower elevation? I'm saying because, you see, because they, you see a you see an area that's wet and above it it's dry and mm -hmm. below it it's dry. Yeah. Well, in this, in, in our specific situation, John, the uh, the groundwater is well below, is well below um, PCH. Right. You're saying it's it's draining from yes. the, the the location of the house well below PCH. That's There's right. Nothing, nothing in between. Right. That would stop it from flowing straight down. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, may, I, may I ask a question as well, uh, yes. Mark? Uh, I believe it was one of the geologists. Someone mentioned a a new lateral slide that would require caps to be put essentially horizontally to prevent this area of the street where the project is proposed from moving towards the ocean. That was the first I'd heard of that, and I'm not clear as to whether that's something you've addressed or you you think is an actual factor. Well, that was the first that, that I've seen that too. And we haven't seen any any indication of that in our studies. Um, he was saying that there was, that it wasn't proper, that the fill wasn't properly placed, that he, she showed some alluvium, which would be some surficial material below the fill and that, that maybe that, that that fill was moving. But on our site specifically, we're eight, we have about eight to 10 feet of, of that fill and we haven't seen we haven't seen any indication in any of our borings of, of landslide or movement of that. So I haven't I haven't um, but that was the first I saw of, of his of his report. A, a follow up question to that then, which you've yeah. probably just answered. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to reduce this to the lowest possible common denominator because yeah. 
battles of experts. I, I'm, I don't pretend to be a, a geologist or a geotechnical engineer, but right. has anything of a material nature changed in the instability issue since this was approved twice previously by the Planning Commission and then reapproved by the City Council? I have not seen anything that, that has changed um, significantly. Mark, okay, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. It was 1991 the last time a factor of safety was done? Or did for the, you do for, one? For the, I'm sorry? Did you do one or is 1991? 1991 was the, was the last one that was done for the Big Rock Mesa landslide. Okay, did you do one for this property? We did for a lo more like a local stability, and that's where that 1.37 factor of safety came up. But is that a, a standard? Would that test compare to the prior tests? Uh, no, it's, it's not taking the whole the whole landslide into effect. That's with the way that this this project was 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 um, was done with respect to that variance for slope stability. We just needed to show lo that local slope stability but not overall slope stability of the Big Rock Mesa landslide. And what was that slope stability? 1.37. Okay. Um, okay, uh, anybody else have any questions? I got a question for Don Michael. So do I. <laughs> Don, are you, are, you are you still on the line, Don? Yep. I'm here, go ahead. Okay. So one of the findings we have to make is is whether or not um, the granting of variance would be detrimental uh, or injurious to the property in the vicinity. And the project engineers say, no, it won't be. What is it your opinion that the project would be detrimental to the neighboring properties? And if so, what's the basis for your conclusion? Uh, good question. The city's and everyone's concerned about safety factors and what they mean and how, how, uh, what level they should function at is at this point irrelevant. It has nothing to do with what a safety factor should be. Uh, as far as redevelopment or new development goes. The fact is the evidence strongly indicates both with regard to the Big Rock Mesa uh, landslide debris mass, uh, as well as Inland Lane cul-de-sac area now, in both cases, fractures strongly, strongly indicate a safety factor of 1.0. And in that circumstance, all of your discussions about what safety factor should mean for redevelopment and new development and so on is out the window. It's irrelevant. It's not probative of any issue that's before you. The question is whether Don Michael knows what he's talking about when he says it's reasonable to think the safety factor is 1.0. That's the question before you. And the only way to decide on that, I would think, is to uh, put in a slope indicator or two and see if they add down a sufficient depth incidentally uh, to see if there is movement. And so basically a, a, a factor of safety of 1.0 is, is it's moving, right? A safety factor of 1.0 means that it's on the verge of moving. Anything lower than 1.0 means movement. Okay, but, but here's my question. The, 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 the couple of factors have been mentioned. One is that um, the project as proposed will actually reduce the downward pressure because the weight of the dirt removed um, will is is greater than the weight of the new construction okay by six or seven hundred tons is it is it and, and so what the question we're trying to answer is does the proposed project make the safety of the surrounding properties better, worse, or no change, all right? So I understand your position about how the fact that this is really down sort of point one, but without regard to that, does, would, does this proposed project make the safety of the surrounding properties better, 
worse or no change? Worse. Uh, the idea that the weight uh, exchange is involved in, is highly, I think it's irrelevant. What is, the question is, how does groundwater affect the uh, load uh, on the, on a, on a perceived critical surface? You can't hypothesize, well, you can, but it's irrelevant to hypothesize that if you exchange the loads, in the in the in the property where you're discussing that somehow that improves the safety factor you have to show by actually evaluating the strength of the materials the sheer sheer strength of the fill uh, whether or not a change in the load would have any effect uh, it's difficult in these zoom meetings uh, without the ability to diagram, uh, the, to help you understand the technical uh, aspects of the question, I right. strongly advise you to at least get some sort of written documentation from Mark or Don Kowalski or me, some written uh, documentation asking us specific questions about that which you're observed, you're concerned now, Jeff. I understand fully the the commissioner's concern about this matter, and in the face of it, at this point, the cracks in cul-de-sac uh, pavement of Inland Lane strongly suggests movement. Okay, Don, let me stop you right there for a second. And, and I appreciate that it's difficult in these Zoom meetings because you don't get a chance to draw a diagram. But I'm looking at your report that you did for the uh, Piedra Chica project back in November 20 of 2018. And I read that, and it's got all the diagrams in there. But, but I think I understand that, that, you know, the idea of behind the geology, if not the details. Um, but your conclusion, going back to what you just said, my question was, does it make it better, worse, or no change? And your conclusion was that uh, you think it makes it worse. And, and is it fair to say that that conclusion is based upon the fact that you feel that any level of effluent put into the groundwater uh, is going to increase the danger to the neighboring properties? I don't think that... Uh, is a minor amount of increase uh, in uh, the SO272 and learning system can affect the concern that I expressed in my November uh, 20, 2018 report. Um, it has a great deal to do with the safety of that, of that particular site, but statistically, it is irrelevant with regard to the problem of movement of the main mass of the uh, Big Rock Mesa landslide. Okay. And I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, strugg I'm struggling to grasp uh, what the basis for your conclusion that it makes the situation worse is then. You, you don't believe that removing the dirt is going to be significantly helpful. Uh, and if, the if it's not groundwater, what is the basis for your conclusion that it makes the situation worse? See, what we have to do is we have to we have to know we have to be able to figure out whether there's substantial evidence in the record to support a decision one way or another. So that's why I'm trying to nail you down a little bit on on the basis for your your uh, for your for your opinion because you know you're you're a qualified geologist and you've got a lot of experience in this area and so you, whatever you say is going to be substantial evidence. But I would I just want to know what the what the basis for your decision or for your conclusion rather that it makes that this project would make the surrounding properties less safe. The reason it would be less safe is because if the mass failed, uh, not only would it affect the property that's in, within the uh, area that sus 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 I suspect would move 20276 and 20272, but because 20260 and 20252 are immediately adjacent, if a slide occurred, the shear 
say the, the, the shearing would be immediately adjacent to those properties and would absolutely affect the stability. Uh, okay. Okay. I, 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 I get where you're going with that. I understand what you're saying, and I'm not trying to argue with you, but, but what I'm trying to get at is that you're saying that if a slide occurred, and clearly if a slide occurred, there would certainly be damage to everybody probably in the entire Mesa. But the question is, what about this project makes it more likely that a slide is going to occur? The difference is that the safety factor is now one, 1. 0. Let's say that's the case, although it could be moving. What happens when it starts to rain? There, There is no way to guarantee that in the near future, the change in the groundwater levels will actually um, change the movement from creep to uh, catastrophic. And that is the fact. Your concern that I can't prove it right now uh, is, is understandable. But really what should be happening is um, Jill Concepts should have looked at this property with respect to the possibility of a catastrophic movement, and then we can talk about it. But right now, you're in a position of trying to figure out what to do <clears throat> where a property has a, say, a demonstrated or a very strong suspicion of a safety factor of 1.0. What happens tomorrow? Uh, I, I don't envy you. Okay, I, I, I get it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Don, Don, this is John. Could I ask you a couple questions? Um, you're you're saying it's 1.0 because it's actually not moving right now, but we had uh, I believe it was uh, the city the geologist. I think his name Mike Phipps. Phipps say that it it had moved, and uh, two two a half an inch one year, and during the earthquake it moved, and that was kind and, of nasty. Uh, and so. And then we have a requirement on this house to have expansion joints and loops in the phone lines because it's moving. Uh, if it's moving, it's it's a landslide, isn't it? Technically. Am I supposed to be, is there a question there? Yeah, the question is, what is a landslide? If, if the land's moving, is that technically a landslide? Is that technically over 1.0 or under? Yes. <clears throat> when the landslide is moving, the, um, the the mathematical concept of a safety factor goes out the window. When the cracks indicate to me, after looking at a lot of landslides, periodic movement. Otherwise, the cracks don't occur. When they're oriented the way they have been uh, in the the inner lane uh, cul-de-sac and the way I show them on diagrams that I prepared for Dr. Wong, no geologist, Mike Phipps, good geologist, uh, everybody involved in this has experience. None of them, none of them can say that those cracks have no relevance with regard to the possibility of a safety factor of 1.0. Okay. Can, can I ask a clarifying question? I, I think we're having a trouble with what is it, because I think that Mike Phipps' observation was on the broader landslide. There's been movement kind of a lot around the big you. mass. Yes, I agree. Okay. And then it's your observation more in this kind of uh, Pedro Chica inland lane uh, sub area where you're concerned about the more catastrophic failure. Is that just to clarify what is it in your statements versus um, Mike Phipps? Uh, the, the concern with Piedra Chica is a local problem with regard to whether or not the Nababi property would increase the groundwater level there. It, it, if you'll forgive me, this entire eastern area of Big Rock Mesa is underlain by um, something called the uh, Payuma member of the Cespi Formation. And it we get into technicalities very quickly when we start ducking, du discussing that. But don't mistake Piedra Chica road problems. Don't mistake the main mass of the Big Rock Mesa landslide and the fractures all around it that clearly indicate that the uh, debris mass is moving. Don't 
mistake that with what is going on in the Inland Lane cul-de-sac. So are you saying Inland Lane is independent of Piedra Chica and then overall independent of the mass in terms of your observations, or are yeah. Piedra Chica and Inland tied? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Sorry, when, when you're, you, uh, you were advising to kind of treat separately the overall mass of Big Rock and its movement separated from the Piedra Chica movement, which you've documented in your, your submissions, um, is that, are those two moving independently of what you see on Inland Drive as well? Or is Inland acting as Piedra Chica is? I see. Good, good question. What's going on in Piedra Chica, the perch squatter problem, and what's going on in Inland Lane are separate. They're distinct with regard to the stability of the Big Rock Mesa landslide mass period. They can happen whether or not the Big Rock Mesa landslide debris mass moves, moves again or not. They are independent, mechanically independent conditions, and they have to be considered in those terms. Can, can I just return to Jeff's question for you, Don, for just one second? If whether whether in the lane is is a factor of one and it's moving now, or it's one point two or one point three or a higher number, the question that we have to deal with is: Will this structure and this new groundwater exacerbate whatever the condition is now. Forget what the number is. Uh, will this amount of incremental new water infiltrating down apparently to, you know, 200 feet below sea level or something, is this going to make it worse? As far as I can see, yes. Any increase in the uh, amount of water from the uh, wh whatever septic system will be used will exacerbate the condition. I, let me ask, add a comment to that, David. I have a house in, in Lagoon, and I've had it for close to 50 years. Um, and when the slide, the Bluebird Canyon slide came along, Normally, Trevor and, and Christy say, oh, don't worry, you can get a waiver and city's not responsible. But what happened there was the city had reason to know that it was moving. And the judge said, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't get permits on unstable ground. You're paying for everything. And it was a, it shut the city down basically for two years. It took 50% of the budget. If that's correct, and this is going a little beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, um, if we're determining that, you know, new drops of water are going to make the situation worse, then we shouldn't be talking about allowing anybody to do anything up there, right? Uh, if they're within this area and they're adding a bathroom, adding a faucet, asking, adding a fixture, if this is the, the path we're going down, by definition, if that makes it worse and exacerbates the slide, that's, that's the end of the ballgame. Well, no, I, 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 I must disagree with you fellas. The drop of water doesn't make a damn bit of difference. What makes a difference is the fact that there is reason to believe the thing is sus, sus, uh, susceptible to movement at, as we speak. And since that is the case, and no geologist, Don Kowalewski, me, uh, Mike Phipps, um, Mark, uh, I'm sorry, forget Mark's last name, uh, but in any event, no matter what they might say in a report, all of them must say that because of the evidence of the possibility that the thing is has a safety factor of 1.0 as we speak, that the rational thing to do is to find out if, if whether or not how difficult, how uh, whether or not there's actually something to worry about that can be fixed. I'm telling you right now, from my experience, that the only way to make that property safe is to try to put in rock bolts, where I've shown in, in a diagram that I uh, sent to uh, uh, Dr. Wong for, for purposes of this hearing. And no matter how you fellows want to slice it or dice it with regard to what a safety factor means and what drops of water go where, you cannot rationally afford to ignore the conditions that are apparent in the, in the lane cul-de-sac at this time now. 
And, and to clarify that that would um, that would help rectify the observations you're making in the inland lane slash Pedro Chica area where there's that local movement. Obviously, we still have the larger um, overall big rock slide, which which no this, question. Yes, absolutely. The, yeah. the, as I said, uh, Pedro Chica and inland lane, whatever other areas you want to talk about, are independent of the main mass movement. That's a separate condition. And whatever happens there has an, anything to do with co what could happen at Lillian in Kulisak. Try and understand that. Right. I, but, um, John, it, it would seem only fair to let the applicants, geologists, respond to some of what we've just been talking about for a minute um, since. You will call them and we'll have them talk. Can Mark can Mark get back on and uh, you know, speak to this just for a minute? Sure, Mark. Yes, I'm yeah. here. Was, oh, there you go. Hi, John. I, I did have a question for Don though. Um, he was talking about the inland this inland uh, lane problem, and I wanted to know how deep he thought that uh, landslide was. Well, we'll have to. Uh, the que the question was how deep does it go? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you? No, because we the, all the holes we drilled on the site, we didn't we didn't hit any landslide. What what I think happened? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. When uh, Geoconcepts was called to look at this property, you assumed that the property was stable because it had been stable for uh, something like sixty years. And there was no reason to think that a new geotechnical study would have to be done, and that's why you didn't do it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that when if you look at the history of Big Rock Mesa, as I have uh, for 60-some years, uh, you'll realize that you have to consider local conditions and the, the local condition of which you were probably unaware uh, at the time you did your work involved the fractures in in the main cul-de-sac road pavement, which incidentally has been repaved recently. But in any event, uh, please take a look at the uh, diagram if you get a chance. Uh, the, the diagram that I have uh, included in my materials I sent along to Dr. Wong. Okay, thank you, Don. Mark, can I ask you a question on that? Yes, Don. We, on, on the thickness of the, the uh, slide. Mm -hmm. I thought we were told in this in your staff report that you couldn't use a, a, a pile, what is it, pylon foundation to make it stable because it was over 350 feet deep. Right. And the toe right. was on the highway. Right. So right. that's a that's a pretty deep landslide. Well, absolutely. But what I think Don's talking about is a is a smaller, shallower slide. But he doesn't know how deep that shallow slide is. Is it ten feet? Is it fifty? Is it a hundred? He okay. wasn't able to to say that. So, but everything that we drilled to sixty feet, we had we had bedrock, but we didn't have any any landslide any any active landslide planes through that material. So I haven't seen anything of that. So, David, David, I'm sorry. Let's go back to you. Did you have something for me on that? question no you you just answered it just now okay all right well, let you. me take let me follow it up on it because i was asking a series of questions to, to mm -hmm. don michael uh mm -hmm. about the impact of of uh of whether this house whether this project is going to make the danger to uh adjoining properties greater lesser or no impact and and i take it that he don's opinion was that the decrease in weight would not be a significant factor in improving the situation. Is that your opinion as well? I, I, I take it it's not because of what we read in the staff report, but just go ahead and say it. If, if but no, it is a factor, um, it is a factor of, of several. So they are removing some, so we are removing some of the driving force at the top of that slope. But really what we're doing is we're, we're, um, we're putting the, 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 uh, the home on a pile foundation into the bedrock portion of the landslide. And we're um, it's significant in improving the drainage, which will keep will keep water out of the out of the ground. The septic system is is a is the state of the art updated um, system, so it'll reduce solids and it'll it'll have an impact there. 
and they're reducing to either zero or very minimal landscaping. And so it, the, the overall, the cumulative effect of all those will, will be to make the, the site safer that's even, even now where, where it is now without a house or based on what the house was before. Can I ask something on that? Um, mm -hmm. You said the bedrock portion of the landslide. Right. The landslide's toe is on Coast Highway. Right. Are there different bedrocks in between the toe well, and the top? Well, yeah, because the, the land, it's a, it's a bedrock landslide, so there's a component. What, what, what I say there is because there's artificial fill on top, say eight to 10 feet of artificial fill, and then there's bedrock, but it's, it's landslide, but it's the bedrock component of the landslide as opposed to the, the artificial fill. So you're, you're going through the artificial fill into, we're putting, that's right. into a landslide, not into That's right. That's right. So, so it's not so, bedrock. It's moving. Or it could move. Right. Okay. But, but so just to kind of crystallize this, your 60 foot drillings don't show an inland lane landslide that Don is saying is he's fairly certain is existing right now. That's right. So if that is true. We need a tie-breaking uh, boat here. You no, know, I was just wondering, is that if that's true, is there any explanation for any movement? I mean, if there's cracks and there's this and there's that, right? Is that just asphalt drying up, or, or does that indicate movement? Because it can only be one or the other, right? And is anybody there, ever or, test? Or, where it's cracking. Or yeah, could that slide be deeper than 60 feet? So it, it could support both. That's that's true. That's true. Um, but also none of the uh, none of the reports that, that Fugro did specifically calls out any any significant movement over in that area. Um, generally, the generally the, the the inclinometers have been very, very minor to um, you know just the the basic minimum of uh, of the reading. So there's no there's no indication specifically that I've seen that that area is moving more than any other area. Well, that's the. Could you say that without taking without saying more than any other area? That, the, okay. Yeah. So I haven't seen there that are, our problem is yeah, I haven't seen yeah I haven't seen that there's any significant movement in that area based on the data from Fugro's reports in the past however many years. Okay, and the I, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the debacle on Coast Highway in the 80s where the half the hill came down. I don't know if it was exactly there or not. Um, that would be considered another one of these local landslides? Yeah. Okay. Because I had to walk around that one for six weeks. Uh, yes. Okay, does anybody have any more questions of Mark? Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I've got a question for, if Jeff, if you're done. Done. Okay, I've got a question for uh, either Richard, uh, actually, Richard, if you're still here. Um, I'm here. CCNRs. Uh, does the city ignore CCNRs? Because I've seen in many staff reports, the CCNRs in that area don't allow blah, blah. And, and then we don't do it. Um, are we going to say if there's a CCNR that says 15 feet high and whatever else they said, uh, how does this factor into the staff report and, and does this get approved or not approved and then they have to get sued or how does that work? What we do in areas where we know there are CCNRs is we do ask that the owner meet with the the association to find out what it is they want and work with them on a design prior to bringing it to us for review because the city is not privy to all the ccnrs in the city and it's also ccnrs are civil agreements between property owners and uh, uh, trevor can speak to that a bit more so we are bound by our codes and what's in the mmc and lcp and that's the criteria that we used for this and uh, the other issue I should bring up, which we have a hard time with uh, homeowners associations, is that we don't fully understand their operations, uh, quite frankly, because some 
there are some HOAs that are formed for purposes of use. And when we've looked into it in the past uh, for other projects, the association has explained to us they don't review uh, development. They're more for the purposes of preserving views. Some are for the purposes of maintaining roads. And so we leave those civil agreements up to the property owners. Uh, but if you know them. they have a, if you know they have CCNRs, you have the have the uh, applicant or the developer follow them, talk to the CCNR committee, and have them follow them. Is that right? I mean, it's pretty hard to miss the fact that something like Big Rock would have a homeowners association. The last time we looked into the Big Rock Homeowners Association, what was told to staff was that the primary purpose of that HOA is for um, maintenance of landscaping and view protection, but not actual <coughs> development. And so as I mentioned, that's one thing we were told. We, you know, without actually being part of the HOA, the city is not exactly, Trevor, you may want to jump into this one, we don't know fully what those HOAs do or what their rules are. And that's why we limit our review to the documents we have, which are the city's MMC and also our local coastal program. Yeah, but it, we, we don't enforce an HOA, CCNRs. You know, those could be complicated. Some of the rules they have could be illegal. You know, there's a lot of, sometimes, you know, these are put through by people that are are not on top of you know, the latest developments in you know what's allowed under those. Um, it, it would take a lot of research from us to go and, and deal with those things, but we don't enforce it. You know, we don't you stand in the way of them enforcing it if they want to. But we are just in the commission here. We're applying the city's rules and saying we're saying I'm not saying you can build this for sure. We're saying our codes allows you know our code allows you to build this. You know, if you know, if you have other codes you need to apply you need to comply with, and that's on you to go deal with. But you know the city will issue permits that, that would allow you to build per our code. That's what we issue. And, and if the homeowners association, well, I guess they have to sue, okay? Well, they can sue, yeah. they can fine them, they can, They have, you know, their own ways to enforce these. Being... Okay, but if there's an enforcement action, do you give, do you give a certificate of occupancy? And then what do you do if they lose? If they lose, they're going to have a, a, a court order. A, a judge is going to come in and order them to make changes. Then they would come to apply to amend whatever permits they have with the city. And then that would be evaluated. Okay. Okay. Um, let me get back to Richard a second. Or, or actually, I forgot who's... Um, Just give, give me one second. Is it Lily? Lily, are you in charge of this? Yes. Yes, I'm um, here. It looks to me like both floors of the house are pretty much the same size, square footage wise. So how do they meet the two thirds rule? I'm pulling up the square footage now, but we did do that analysis and we did find that the the area below 18 feet in height is, um, well, the area above 18 feet in height does meet the, uh, the two thirds requirement. That's on page nine of the staff report. Well, I show uh, on page nine, one floor at 1,535 and one floor at 1490. And that means it's a 45% or that means it's pretty close to it, not two thirds. So how did that happen? Those, those are definitely not two thirds of each other. They're only off by 45 square feet. Right. Um. I will uh, look into the plans a, a bit and follow up. Okay. I mean, our, our calculation is, is based on 
the height of the structure and the only parts that are over 18 feet in height is the area that is exposed on the south side of the residence, which is which exceeds 18 feet in height. Everything else is is sort of subterranean. But it's a floor. It's not a basement. It's a floor. And you major from finished grade. So it definitely is. Okay, so um, down in PDSF, it, it is not a basement. So it looks to me like the two thirds rule was violated, clearly violated. The the cover sheet clarifies that. I, I think that's a typo in, in the agenda report, but the cover sheet shows the lower level at 2302 and the first floor, which is the second floor is 1490. 3,700 square feet without the outside, without the outside buildings. Doesn't sound right. Uh, nine, nine of, let's see. It says the lower on page 19 of 29, it says the ground floor is 1921 oh, and the top floor is 1490. Like, anyway, I, guess, I guess another way to put the question is what's the difference in uh, slide A3 in the, in the packet um, between first floor and lower level? Is everything, since this is a day letting basement, as the applicant described, is the whole lower floor considered that first floor in the calculation? Because if it is, then we're way off. Well, it has to be. Right. And it, yeah, so the, the two thirds rule, and, and I'm sorry, I'm um, looking at this as I speak, but in the zoning conformance table of the cover sheet, the two thirds rule is highlighted in red with the lower level at 2302. Two thirds of that is 1535. And the plans show that the proposed second level is 1490. Okay, so when you say lower level and first floor on page site A3, there you're distinguishing lower level is kind of that basement. Uh, what looks like a basement, daylighting basement, first floor is what's visible uh, from the street level, from grade. Like That's from right. Inland Drive. Okay. But on page 19 and 29, it says, quote, the, the residents on the south side of Inland Lane is a, sing, a single story, the 19, the 19, 20, 100 square foot ground floor would be visible from Inland Lane and the 2,018 square foot lower level uh, is tucked under that. You know, it's those numbers came from somewhere. Right, so so this the number on, I, it clicked for me. Um, on page nine, the maximum allowable second floor area above 18 feet is 1535. And what the applicant is proposing is 1490, which is less than the, the 1535. But does that include the covered patio? The it, it includes um, it says the ground floor level is nineteen twenty one. Where do you see this fifteen twenty five? Uh that's, that's the maximum allowed on the two thirds. Yeah, but where is that? That's uh page nine. It's also on slide sheet number eight three both places. On page nine, it says two thirds rural first floor times two thirds equals. Okay, so the first floor, and it says the first floor is uh, two thousand eighteen. Yeah. So I don't know where the maximum came from. That's my problem. That maximum is incorrect. The, the, the first floor is 2302. Right. And two thirds of that is 1535. There you go. 
again, where, where are you getting those numbers? Because on page 19, you quote different numbers. Where is the, where is the, where does it show that that's the first floor? I'm looking at the, the cover sheet of the plans. And going back to um, your question about page 19, I think that was a carryover from the previous project design that was not um, updated. Okay, so so I, I'm looking at this cover sheet and it says two thirds rural, the first floor, two thirds of 2302. Is that number anywhere else? Because that's, that's a part of the calculation. That's not stated as a fact. What page you on, John, there where you're looking the at? The cover sheet. Lily, is the issue here that the architect drew a first and second floor? However, there's a two thirds rule, which is saying the portions of the building below 18 feet shall not exceed two thirds of the portion above. And so when you look at the design of this building, you have a portion of that lower level that is definitely below 18 feet and then the the level above the lower level as you run, as you move towards the street side of the building, um, towards away from the ocean, I should say, that portion of the building is on grade and not above anything beneath it. So those portions would also count in the 18, as the part below 18 feet that would feed into your uh, lower level. bottom level total. Right, I think the way this was calculated takes more conservative approach where it does look at the, the lower level in the first floor as opposed to what's below 18 feet and what's above 18 feet. If we were looking at what's below 18 feet and what's above 18 feet, then, then the areas above 18 feet would be much less. I don't understand why it's two floors, but whatever. That can always be cha challenged on appeal, I guess. Um, well, well, one other question on the covered areas. I know we'd had another project where we considered covered areas on a first floor uh, included in TDSF space, but it looks like, according to the discovery sheet, on the second floor, we're not including this uh, extra 618 feet. Does that sound right? I just want to clarify. Now, I'm finally looking at attachment to this A.00 uh, sheet, A.00. Um, cause I know we've, we've had, um, a couple different kind of findings in how we look at covered balconies. I'm just trying to figure out if this is included or not in that second floor calculation, you know, the, the upper level, however you want to term it in this, in the structure, it looks like it's not. Right. It is included in the TDSF. Uh-huh. But is it included in the two thirds? It, it's everything is below 18 feet in height, with the exception of the south facing wall. Um, so so you, this, this house has eight foot plates. Seems pretty short. Well, it's it's sunken into the ground, so for the most part, the lower level is, is buried. Underground, that's, that's, that's irrelevant. It's we measure from finished grade. The daylights, it's finished grade. It's it, right, and so the south facing area does daylight. So the whole floor is finished grade. That's where you measure it from. Anyway, um, I'll let you work on that. We can move on. 
Richard, I'll let, let you. Uh, John, uh -huh. I just point out that there's on the bottom of my screen, it says two participants have raised their hand. Um, maybe they have some light to shed on the calculation. How do I know who that is? It's me. How, uh, Alex, who's asking to talk? Norm Haney and Joe Drummond. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll wait until we ask. We open it up to the public. Yeah, again. now John Condon has uh, raised his hand. I know, I don't want to reopen uh, on a technical question. No, neither of them are planners. Um, Richard, in our the prior time we heard this, there was discussion about how there's, and it's in here, there's a manual that they have to create, or that is created on, basically it says, you gotta have loops in the in all the electrical cords and expansion joints and all this stuff. And, and every, every time it rains an inch in a week, which is quite often in a real year, they have to go and inspect it. And it can be a, a qualified individual, whatever that is. Uh, but in the prior one we had, and I don't have it, I'm doing this from memory, they had a certain number of days to report that to the city, that this sucker's moving. Okay, basically, if it was. And I don't see that in, in this manual. Is there a reason why that isn't there? And how would the city ever know it wasn't moving? Right. No, there's, um, you know, that might have just been inadvertently left off by our geotechnical staff because they normally do require that as a condition as part of any time, you know, we consider granting a factor of safety variance, our geotechnical staff pretty much drafts all the outlines of what they want in those manuals that you are referring to. And so it may have been an oversight by our geotechnical staff, but there's no reason why we couldn't require that. And then as far as the reporting of it, if I understood you correctly, how do we know um, with all of these, it, it's a requirement that as when they record this on the property, because it'll be a, a covenant type uh, requirement, they are under law required to do it. And, and uh, should they not do it and something happen, uh, you know, or there's a reason, for example, if we find a history of um, uh, a lack of maintenance, it gives the city the ability to take action against the homeowner. Actually what? Take action against the homeowner if we find violations of that. Our building official can take action against them. And Well, my, my question in, in Malibu, has it ever happened? Where we didn't require something and then we took action? To my knowledge, I think we've maybe done one or two of these types of variances um, that have actually not, that have actually been built. I should when I say this, it's not that we haven't approved more, but it's more of the the two that I could think of that actually went to the phase of construction of obtaining permits. Uh, we have not had any issues with those that we've been made aware of, and no subsequent applications have come in, to my knowledge, for repairs. Okay, and uh, uh, one of the people on that tape that was played, I think it was the city geologist, said that no new houses had been built in Big Rock because we, they, you didn't allow it. Is that right? 17 have been built since the 90s. Yeah. No, sure. remodeled or, or, re, or replaced. Yeah, I would... I would be careful on how we say Big Rock because I believe there have been some new houses that are on some of the streets that feed off of Big Rock. And well, I should say assessment district. Yeah, I think in the actual assessment district, I believe it's been replacements related to the fire. A new, new development on vacant parcels, I believe, has happened. Uh, on streets outside of the the the, the more developed, the more suburban, we'll say, uh, the part of Big Rock. 
Now, how long does a, a property have to remain vacant to be considered vacant? Well, when I say vacant, and, and once and this is where uh, Trevor's uh, may want to weigh in, I'm saying that in terms of a property that's never, uh, we have, can't find any history of development. Uh, because when we look at these factor of safety variances, uh, we are careful to look at the, the past history of was that property ever built? Uh, that has had a play, for example, on a PCH factor of safety variance uh, that we we uh, recommended approval of. And on that one, we were able to find a clear history of a structure being on the property and also that structure being demolished by the property owner and not actually demolished by a natural disaster. Okay. Um, Okay, somebody, uh, Lily, did you figure that one out? The two thirds rule. Well, it, so as far as the overhangs, it looks like there is an overhang. Well, the other overhangs that I'm I'm seeing now, and I, I haven't completely figured it out, but it looks like they are below 18 feet in height. But I still need to confirm that. Okay. But and one one other quick question: Can we take a look? I just want to use an illustration to help understand how we're interpreting uh, this. Um, what is it? Sheet number A seven. If if we can all kind of flip to that on each of our presentations, um, it shows the average natural grade uh, line and then the max building height eighteen foot. Um, I'm assuming that in the calculations that you're running, Lily. You're looking for everything underneath that that kind of um, upper envelope, but to John's point, shouldn't that natural grade be pushed down to the level of that? What's that lower floor? I think is the phrase that was used um, in another section to determine that 18 foot, because that is not considered a basement; it's considered a lower floor. Correct? You're, you're right. It is considered a lower floor, but the the area is, is buried, and this is a section, so it shows what's below ground as, as you're looking at the site, right? The east or the west. So, this shows the average natural grade where the grade is, um, and, and the finished grade, which is above that. So, this is taking the measurement of the building height from the average natural grade and going up, and, and it shows that it's, it's below 18 feet. In height from the lower of the two. No, I understand. But, but we're, we're talking, I yeah. think the point is, why aren't you measuring it from the finished grade? Right, because because if this were a basement, that's not my understanding. We would not, look, we'd look at it as a basement, but this is daylighting, so it's a, you know, first floor. You know, that's part of the confusion that came up in this whole calculation John brought up. I mean, it seems like, I, I think no one would argue with the very um, kind of you know, what left of this illustration where we've got the daylighting happening, that's the, that's the grade that we all agree to take heights off of. But as we get to the back of the house, we go up to this average natural grade. Am I, am I misreading that? Or is that kind of how this is being interpreted? Because it seems like to, to John, you know, to Chair Maz's point that the uh, lower floor it's a lower floor that's that's the grade that should, everything should be measured from for that two-thirds calculation right and, and, and the finished grade is measured from and i think where the finished grade hits the exterior wall exterior of the house okay so and that's kind of where that dashed lower da black uh, dashed line is is kind of where that grade is is hitting the structure on the exterior right because you really can't see anything below that. You've got windows down there. How can that be? Uh, Looking out a window to dirt? I think there's a, like a stairway that runs along the side of it there. Yeah, so it's where the, the finished grade is. And the finished grade is not where it's shown. That's, an, that's the natural grade. So anyway, I, I highly question the two-thirds rule. I highly question 
you know, that you can dig a house into the ground and, and, and not count it as, as, as part of the house. You know, you got a house that's obviously more than 18 feet high. There's no question about it. Right, and, and a site plan review is included in this project to account for the fact that it is 18 feet high. We're, we're, not, we're not calling it a, a basement or our subterranean. We are calling it as the lower level of the house. Okay, so if you if you if you were standing in the master bath underneath the dining room from where you're standing you where your feet are to the to the top of the the second story is certainly not 18 feet I think um, th th there's a site plan review that that allows for the for the increase above 18 feet. That's part of the project. That's that is, but us. not the site plan review never affects the two thirds rule. Right, it's a two thirds. The calculation that that does seem like it's a, it's like we kind of have two lines. One we're using using for that 18 foot determination, the other for the two thirds, and they don't seem to be consistent. I mean, okay. It, yeah, it's a first floor. It's a first floor. So I, I agree. I think that two thirds rule calculation does seem to be off. Okay. Um, so we're at a point where where you know now we're nitpicking on uh, this house could be in in uh, you know on the beach the way we're has nothing to do with the fact that. We have to determine, in my opinion, that the city has for this property a factor of safety. And I can see no reason to believe that one has ever been determined. 1991, they did one for the whole area. I don't know anywhere where this 1.37 factor of safety has used an inclinometer, has drilled, drilled down in the ground, has evaluated the fact that there's cracks in the road, um, et cetera. So I'm going to have a hard time voting for this unless I'm provided with that information because the city has enough information to know that this project is most likely moving, okay? They got reams of data on that. They've actually got measurements. So Don Michael says if it's moving, it's 1.0 or going to be shortly less than that if it if it slides. Um, that, in my opinion, gives the city huge liabilities. So I, uh, I and that is because we're approving something we know is moving. So I think that this project should be continued until we get the evidence of the factor of safety. Because we have to make a variance on a real number. And we don't have a real number. Even if we want to make a variance of 137, if it turns out to what happens if it turns out to be one two? Okay? We have now just violated the city's standards on giving variances. So that's that's why I have real problem with this project. I, I, as it stands now, I can't make that finding. Um, now, we know in a month, we have this huge discussion on what should be done about the fact that there's problems in Big Rock. That may change the way we think. But to, to do this a month before that discussion even starts, uh, is folly in my in my opinion, but uh, so I, if I, Norm, could I ask you a question? Jeez. We open up. Norm. I've had my hand up for some time, so uh, I welcome. See, Norm, I can't see you, so this Zoom thing sucks. But uh, um, I agree with that. <laughs> We're sitting in a situation where uh, obviously this is probably going to be appealed and blah, blah, blah. But you eventually want to win that. And 
Um, I assume you're appealable to the coastal too, so that could be a long time. Uh, do you want to change how you're handling this application at all? Do you want to continue it? Do you want to have us take a vote? Do you uh, continue I, it? I, whatever you want to do. Okay. Uh, I, I, I appreciate can I uh, can I talk to uh, my client first? Sure. How long do you need? Five, ten minutes. Five uh, minutes. Five minutes. I need uh, five minutes. Okay, I'll give you ten. So we'll be back here at five minutes to uh, ten. Thank you very much for your consideration. You want to take ten? We do have one more item tonight, and we're coming in on ten thirty. Yeah, but we got to decide this one first. True. Okay. We should know. Thank you, John. No, it's okay. Everybody, don't talk to each other. Okay. Commissioners, <clears throat> please. Commissioners, please turn off your video when you step away here.
How are we doing? I'm here. All right. Yeah, I think we're we we've gone to ten minutes. Do so we have all we have our quorum back? Do we have Richard and Lily? This is Lily. I'm here. All right. Great. Richard, are you back? All right. We're good. Okay. I'm calling on Norm. Can you unmute him? There we go. Okay. I'm here. I, I want to appreciate, express my appreciation for the time that the commissioners have spent uh, considering this application. And I, um, I did want to make comments with regard to the two thirds rule because I'm, as, as you all know, I've been around for the last, uh, Jesus, uh, 30 years. <laughs> so I know a lot about how those development standards um, have been interpreted. And I think we're consistent with that. But um, I, I've spoken with the owner of the property and with um, um, and, and with with our attorney, Mr. Fred Gaines. And I believe that we're headed for the city council one way or another. We'd like to have an up or down vote uh, so that we can move forward with this project. We we had an approval before. Um, it was a, 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 a um, misdemeanor, basically, uh, with regard to when the request for the for the extension was filed, um, and and so here we are. And uh, a simple statement is: we'd like to have a vote, and um, you know, we'll respect whatever that vote is. And move forward with the project. We know it's going to be appealed to the city council uh, one way or another, and we've already been at this for six years. Okay, thank you, Norm. Uh, I'm going to make a motion to deny the project on the basis that we don't have adequate information to make the findings on uh, public on safety safety factor. <clears throat> I'd also like to add that. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I can do that in this motion, but I'd like to add that the uh, maintenance manual, if this motion fails, well, uh, is has to be violations have to be reported to the city staff. Um, do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second that, John. Okay. Uh, does anybody want to discuss it? Yeah, let me try. Um, first of all, I'm very sensitive to the issue of the stability of Big Rock, or have been for years, ever since the beginning, and I've been around as long as Norm has. Um, and the issue of whether mm -hmm. uh, the issue of whether or not the the maintenance of the dewatering facilities as has taken place and been proper or whether it hasn't been proper. Um, that's an issue that the city council needs to address. It's not really something that we can address and it doesn't really have any bearing on, on uh, what we're trying to do here. So the first question in my mind is, is to look at the application itself and what they're seeking is a variance from the development standard of uh, the, 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 the uh, geologic standard of a, of a, uh, factor of safety of, of 1.5 or the pseudostatic of 1.1. And this is as clear an example of uh, when a variance is compelled as I can think of. And the reason is that there is no way to stabilize any structure on this property to reach the required um, factor of safety because the whole area does not reach that factor of safety. And so um, if you're saying that, that, that we can't grant a variance, then that means that 
not only this house can't be developed on this property, but no house can be developed on this property. Not what I'm saying. And you're muted, but you're shaking your head, but it, that's what it's saying. If there is no house that can be developed, meeting the factor of safety of 0.15, uh, 0.15 or 1.5, I'm sorry. And so that means that you've committed a taking. The variances, the, the, the reason for the variance, if you look at the, the, the findings that have to be made, the first finding is that there are conditions of the property which make it, um, let me see if I can get the exact language here. Um, that uh, there's special circumstances or exceptional characteristics applicable to the subject property, including size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, such as strict application of the zoning ordinance, deprive such property of privileges owned by other property in the vicinity and under the identical zoning classification. The other properties in the vicinity are every other house uh, in the surrounding neighborhood, and they've all got, all those lots have got houses on them, and that's the privilege. No house can be built here without a variance. To that to that standard of safety and it doesn't really matter whether it's 1.5 1.4 1 1.1 you cannot build a house under that standard so that's the first finding we have to make and the first it's, it's not only a finding we can make it's a fact it's a finding we compelled to make now the city could decide that it wants to to um, buy this property and if it does, then I suspect that when this property, when this project goes up on appeal, the city can make that determination. But that's well beyond uh, our pay grade to make that determination. Uh, the city wants to declare a moratorium. Uh, they can do that. Uh, not without cost, but they can, it's within their power to do it. Um, but it's not within ours. So having, that, that's the first finding. The second finding then is whether or not, um, the granting of the variance will not be detrimental to the public interest, safety, health, or welfare, and will not be detrimental or, or injurious to the property or improvements in the same vicinity and zones in which the property is located. So that's, that, that was the basis of my asking all those questions of both Mark and and uh, um, and Ed, not Ed, Don, Michael. And um, I'm convinced that the better part of the, of the better weight of the testimony is that, in fact, the project will not only make the project safer than what exists there now, uh, but um, uh, it will not be detrimental to to the uh, surrounding property. The question is, does it make it worse? That's the typical. That's that's the critical question. Does would this project make it worse? And I don't see. I, I, I tried to get um, Don Michaels to indicate the basis for his conclusion that it would. And I wasn't able to really get enough of a, an understanding of what he was trying to say in order to be able to reach that conclusion. On the other hand, project uh, geologists and geotechnical engineers are pretty clear about why it would make it better. And I think it's persuasive. So that has to do with the with, with whether we can find the two findings. Um, the other aspects of the project, I think, are um, are really you know, sort of inconsequential. The, the minor modification uh, in the site plan review, uh, nobody can see the, the, the portion of the property that's above 18 feet. Uh, none of the surrounding neighbors can see the portion of the property that's above 18 feet. And as a result, they have no protected views. People on uh, Piedra Chica, the woman who bought the house and has her mother living there, sympathize with it. But if you're in real estate, you know that the elevations above 18 feet are not protected views. And um, you know, is, that's been the case for so long now that everybody in real estate ought to know that. Um, so uh, the, other, the other option is, oh, well, we can continue it and, and, and it would go on to, uh, you know, when the city council decides to get around to this hearing and decides whether they want to impose a moratorium or not. Um, in the long run, I don't think that would be um, the most efficient way to deal with this, with this project. Uh, if the city council is going to turn it down, the city council can turn it down on appeal as easily as it can uh, uh, by us waiting, hearing it again, 
and then sending it up back on, on appeal as it will inevitably go back up on appeal again to them. So I'm not going to support the motion. Um, uh, I think that that it, it, it's kicking the can down the road is not a good solution on this. This project has been not only has the project been back and forward several times in, in slightly different variations, but even this particular project has been continued and continued, continued, I think three times at least once at their request, but still it's been continued a long time. So I think the best thing for us to do in terms of efficiency is to is to move it forward, move it to the city council. City council wants to impose a moratorium or wants to buy the property, they can do it. But uh, I think we need to get it off of our plate and onto theirs. I just want to clarify why I made the motion. <clears throat> and it's not quite the way Jeff understands it. <clears throat> I I think we need to we need to determine what our variance is. And our I to me, our variance cannot be you can build a house on a property up to a, a, a slope, uh, whatever it is, a factor of 1.0. That means you're a hair's inch from sliding down a hill on Coast Highway. So you need to determine what is safe and what the actual situation on the lot is. That hasn't been determined. And so the city is saying, if we give this variance, we don't care whether it's safe or not, we're gonna give a variance. That's the very thing that costs Laguna their budget for a whole year. Um, and obviously we cannot give a, it's not a taking when a property is too dangerous to build on. Okay, that's not a taking, and Trevor can answer that. Well, that's a wants. building code issue. And so for us to say, okay, you can take it up to 1.0, but you don't even need to tell us what it is, is opening ourselves up to craziness. All we need to do is have some data, a reason to pick a number. Now, first we got told at one hearing, well, it's gotta be 1.25 or the city won't give it. Well, that's obviously not what we're doing here. So whoever told us that, and it was a planning department person, was wrong, okay? If we give this approval with no limitations, and we, we had the highway closed for six weeks, for a slide on a bluff, okay? Closed. Everybody either driving through the valley or walking across the slide. So um, that until we determine what the situation is on the property, I don't think we can give a variance. Now, uh, I'm, I give, Trevor, you can weigh in. I just wanted to clarify, Chair Mazza, I, I believe you're – you, the, your motion is to deny it because you're not able to make finding two for the variance, which says the granting of such variance will not be detrimental to the public interest, safety, health, or welfare, and will not be detrimental or injurious to the property or improvements in the same vicinity and zones in which the property is located. I just want to make sure you make the right findings for the motion. I'm saying that finding is we can't determine that. You're, yeah, you're not able to make it that because you can't make it. You can't. We could if variance, we have the data. Right? We can't if we don't have the data. That's why I'm making this thing. And it's much bigger than this property. If we close the highway, everybody in Malibu, south, uh, north of it, is screwed. Every business, every tax thing we get, every sales is screwed, okay? Plus, we have a house on the highway. Plus, we could be sued for untold amounts of money. So that's why I'm making the motion. It's not that I, I, I don't, I know I would oppose 1.0. That's like putting the gun up and putting five bullets in the chamber and hoping you get the empty one. But um, that's you know, I'm not going to argue with you. Let's, let's move on. If it's going to be a. And does anybody else have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to point out, I, I also um, am uncomfortable with finding two. 
um, specifically, um, I try to my best to you know take as much input as I can and respect that input from everyone coming in. And when I have really conflicting views from two geologists on observations in the same area, it just it makes me feel like okay, we probably should know a little bit more about what's happening in this local spot to make sure that we don't have a problem which could be detrimental to the public interest. Specifically, if we see cracks appearing observed by one geologist and another geologist saying he did borings, couldn't find evidence of the, the crack which is appearing, it just seems like we need some more information. So I'm not comfortable that we, we have enough information where we're not being detrimental to the public interest, mm -hmm. um, even though I do feel that, that there's been a lot of good work here done. I'm just really uncomfortable with that uh, finding as well right here. I mean, let me let me ask something though. If if you guys are unsatisfied with it, exactly what information do you want? Not just more information. What specific information yeah, do you well, want? Yeah, well, specifically, want... that's why I called that out, Commissioner Jennings. My my observation is that if those two observations they're in conflict, so something is going on. I don't I don't know what it is. And is it that the the there is some slide which is deeper than has been drilled to? I don't know. But but there's something where they conflict, and that makes me uncomfortable. So I, I'm not comfortable making that finding because I, I can't say with confidence that, yeah, everything I've seen in this presentation and the discussion says that is stable. That That's where that's, I am. If I can interject one second, that's the tough role we find ourselves in, we, and I don't think it's going to change. We have two geologists telling us two different things. In an ideal world, we go find a third one who will tell us the right thing. But that's not what's going to happen. We're going to continue to have advocates for one side or the other. And we have to make the best judgment we can make, which is why I was trying to push the same line of questioning that, that Jeff was, because we have one geologist saying, it doesn't matter if you put this house there or not. There's a slide and it's going to happen and that's the way it's going to be. And if that's the case, there's equal reason to approve this as to disapprove this, because it's not going to make a difference. It, oh, it, David, you that, think that if, if it's going to slide, we should approve it? Well, what would you say? Uh, this project isn't exacerbating the situation. Okay. That we're being asked to make a finding, is this making it worse? Is there yeah, a public? I, I just if want I, to add that I'm not, I'm, all I'm saying is do a, a real slope stability study and tell us what it is. Okay? Don't drill a hole 50 feet in the ground and say, I can't find anything. Do a real one. They exist. Okay? You come back and tell us, and we're ready to roll. Well, uh, John, let me ask you this. The, 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 the real study that you want to have, uh, the, the LIP describes in great detail under this section exactly what the study has to be. It, it, it goes on for paragraph after paragraph, exactly the kinds of analysis you have to make. You don't know at this point, because you never asked the question, whether the step, whether the analysis that was made by the project uh, geologist and, and, and geotech is in fact that very study that that uh, the LIP requires. I never, got told. I never got told. That's my. You never point. asked. You never asked. It may be that the, that the study that was done complied with every one of those standards in the LIP. Okay, so we can agree to disagree. Can we have a vote? <laughs> okay. All right. Or we can ask them. They're still on the phone. Yeah. Are we going to call Don Michaels and uh, to do the whole thing over again? No, no. The question Talk is where, the, the, the question is as whether or not the, the study that was done meets the requirements of um, LIP section, whatever it is. As I'm concerned, it's time to vote. Uh huh. Okay, John. Section nine four. So, can we call the vote, please? And the the vote is to um, deny the application for uh, failure to uh, the inability to make finding number two for the variance as detailed by yourself and Commissioner Marks, correct? Yeah, whatever you read me just a while ago. Chair Maza? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? No. Uh, Commissioner Weil? No. Motion failed. Okay. Now can we ask the project engineer whether his study complied with the requirements of the LIP? What's well, the, the section, Richard? What's the section, Richard, the LIP that I'm talking about? Nine four. 
What is it? Nine four. Nine four. Uh, IP I section nine point four, I believe. Yeah. You interested in that information, John? May we ask? May we ask, Mark? Yes, that's what we we're doing. I thought we we're going to ask all three of them. Good. Mark's here. David. Uh, yes, I think I'll. Were you listening to? Yes. Uh huh. So we did. We did. We did um, everything that was necessary for this variance, and in and in the uh, geotechnical review sheet by the city reviewing geologist. He says, in, and I'm going to quote, the applicant and his consultants have provided the city with reports that adequately support the findings in the variance. Okay, and, and, and uh, can I ask you, uh, does this follow that section? Or did he just say that? Can you go through each item in the section and tell us if you did it? Let's, let's why don't we do that? It's, it, uh, have you got a copy of 9.4D? Yeah, I've got not. that here. 9.4D, I mean, it's got a seven. Uh, it's, got, it's got eight sections. Eight sections, nine actually. Nine sections. Nine. You see, it, nine, sorry. Matt, have, I mean. Um, Mark. Mark. Yes. Have you, got, have you got that section available? I do not. Okay, well. Let's. I, we can read it to you, I guess. Do we have um, it reported in our staff report? No, it's not. It's not spelled out in detail. Um, Are we able to bring it up on the screen, Richard? Um, Alex, can I share my screen? Yes, you can. All right, let's do that. All right. I really I think all nine <laughs> items, guys. Sound Sorry. like you're falling down a well, Richard. Yeah, you sound like a robot. <laughs> oh no. I think his internet strange to show us. Go. Oh good. All go. right. Now the question is whether Mark can see that. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on it. Back to the Okay. <clears throat> is it the, is that the, okay, let me see. He, Somebody's is, muted. Yeah. Yeah. Is Mark, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Is this the right section, Richard? That is. Yes. Because in the uh, in the review sheet, he um, he talks about uh, chapter thirteen point two six and the Malibu's LCP, and then the variance of eleven dash oh one eight. Yeah, but this this here says that the analysis shall demonstrate a factor of safety greater than or equal to one point five. Or greater than or equal to 1.1 for seismic. That's that's not part of the uh, of, no. of what's required for this for this no, variant. This, this is the, this is the LIP section that says that that imposes the point the 1.5 uh, static condition, and and the, the the other sections that you referenced are the sections that had to do with variances and so forth. But this right. is this is the analysis of of the uh, static condition that. Uh, that you sort of start with in order to be able to write, uh, come to the conclusion that uh, we don't have uh, a okay. say a factor of safety equal to, to 1.5. Now, maybe okay. you didn't do that analysis because you know that all over Big Rock, it, it doesn't meet that standard. I don't know what, I don't know exactly what you did, but right. Like I said, we did a, we did a local stability um, for that, for the, for the slope below the, the property. And we took into account these, these items and, but we didn't, but we weren't we, because it's a landslide. It didn't meet the one point five. Okay, but you took well, in me, all of these all of these nine factors. You took into account. 
Let me just uh, finish looking at what this is. Because I thought you mentioned in your testimony that you did not do an earthquake study. We did not do seismic. Okay, it's seismic's required. Not for uh, the variance. <clears throat> the study is. Number three says the effects of earthquakes on slope stability mm -hmm. may be addressed. Through sonostatic slope analysis. Right. Not, not isn't addressed. And it wasn't addressed. Okay, so Mark, what would, what would a effective earthquake study tell us? It would be less, it, I would, I would assume that it'd be less because if you can't meet the 1.5, you're not going to meet the one point, the one point one for for seismic. So we're below one point one, and we're trying to give a variance on seismic. Right. Okay. So, um, all right. My, my thinking is, we have the tie-breaking engineers. We have we have uh, geoconcepts, and we have the cities. Geotechnical staff. Right. But we don't have this section. You don't have what? We haven't done what this section says you have to do. Okay, so we got two to two. John, where do we go from here? Well, we're tied. So uh, <laughs> we've been tied before, and it, I yeah. guess it goes to city council. It's pretty you much obvious at about seven o'clock that that's how it was going to end up. But go ahead. What, what, well, Trevor, what do you do when you have a tie? Flip the coin. <laughs> hmm. Well, in this case, I would recommend that you continue it because we're going to. We only have you know four commissioners here, and you know you give them a chance to bring another commissioner on, bring a chance to bring some of the extra information that you guys have requested here. Um, you know, that would be my suggestion is to uh, continue this. When? Well, let me ask Richard, when is this? Oh, you're, you're muted. Oh, I didn't do that. Somebody's after I, me. I can't hear you. Oh, I can hear I can hear him. He's here. Oh. Can you hear me now? Oh, now I can hear you. Sorry, that was me. Uh, what um, you Richard, when is this, this uh, extravaganza at the city council? Uh, the hearing for that is set for the 22nd, I believe it is, of February. It's their second meeting in February. Okay, and what's the next available date in the Planning Commission after that? After that, the next available date would be the Monday, March 1st. And you said it was the 20, 23rd they had their meeting? It, it is calendared uh, the 22nd. Okay. Uh, does March 1st sound like a good date to uh, the council? Let me let me yeah. ask uh, let me ask um, Trevor. Uh, is there any? I, I know that when when new council people come on, there's a certain amount of time that has to take place before they can select uh, commissioners and so forth. And I guess the jobs have to be posted in some way, and you have to accept. Uh, applications and all the rest of that stuff. Do you have any idea of when uh, the the new uh, commissioners might be appointed? Would it be before or after that March first date? I, I've thought all of those uh, had been taken care of. I thought they were being appointed at the next meeting. Is that right, Richard? Well, it, it depends on whether they appoint somebody. They they can appoint them at the next meeting. As right. I understand it, we can theoretically we can serve through January. Okay, the ones that are out. Um, you can serve until your replacements are. are yeah, done. you, you okay. serve until, until replaced. You know, it, so it if somebody wants to wheel and deal, it could go on, but uh, usually mid February uh, is enough time for them to do it. Well, considering it's ten twenty-five, and I don't think it's worth arguing at length over whether we have it come back to us at the first meeting in February or the first meeting in March. So I'm going to say that I think March 1st is okay. Any other objections? Is it March 1st or March 3rd? What, what March 1st. 1st. Well, I, I guess I just, the clarification, I don't have a problem with March 1st, but I'm not sure 
exactly what we're asking here. Are we asking the the battling geologists to separately come back with the detailed reports that go point by point through the section that you just raised? Or are we asking them to get together and see if they can try to come up with a consensus <laughs> among themselves? Because if, if they come back and one says there's a slide and one says they're not, we're not going to be any, any place different than we are right now. Well, I think that what Jeff is saying is if they had gone through that section and done all those studies, then we can grant a variance. Uh, it's not really up to the geologists to decide. It's up to us to decide and up to us to follow the code. Now, I think in reality, it says really who gets appointed to the planning commission. Well, the new appointees would have to sit and watch the recording of this event before they could weigh in. Otherwise, we would have to rehear the whole thing. Uh, and they'd have to read all the letters and all the studies and stuff. Correct, well, uh, Trevor? Yeah, we would ask them to do that. What, one other Sorry. question. The, the applicant was asking for a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, you know, would it be to their benefit at all to just move it forward with a thumbs down in some form? I, I'm just thinking out loud here, but what would be in their best interest rather than having to come back to another commission meeting? Now you got three participants with hand raised. Yeah, you can ask them. Yeah, you, you could ask Fred Gaines if you, or, or yes. Norm if they want to do that, and then you can have a commissioner. Okay, uh, Fred, you want to weigh in? Can we unmute Fred? Yeah. But yes. Got, Thank you, commissioners. Um, we would ask that you would uh, that you would vote tonight. If you you know vote on a motion to approve, if it's two to two, that motion then is denied, and we can appeal. And I think that would be our preference. Uh, and Trevor told us it wasn't. Yeah, no, that that would not be a, a final decision. You would have had two motions that failed. There would be no resolution. So you know you you would need to you know it, the request then would be you know, to ask one of the commissioners to abstain so that you could get a, an approval or a denial, uh, you know, on this, if you want to just get to the, the council. Otherwise you can take a, you can get a continuance and then get a fifth commissioner on here and get a decision. So the two to two is not an, a denial in, in Malibu. No, it fails. But, but a the two to fails. one, a two to one would be a denial. Yes. All right. All right. Am I allowed to tip my hand here? Well, we, we would, would prefer that you take an action that we can that we could appeal and go to the city council. Okay. Well, that would work both ways. I mean, that'd be fine. We could we could approve or deny. It's going to city council anyway. Right. Depends on who writes a seven hundred fifty dollar check. Now, can we rehear the same denial or no? Right, the, the motion for today. Yeah, why don't we re-vote on that motion? You you can. Um, we need a new, we need a new motion. So we need either uh, a motion to approve. You know, we haven't done that yet, or otherwise. Yeah, let's 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 at least fill out the record with that. I'll make a motion to approve the the staff recommendation. And I will second it. In the amendment. <laughs> John. I don't know if this is I I do think it's important that. Uh, we monitor this project and we have the requirement to report to the city when it starts moving. Yeah, absolutely. I'll agree to that. Commissioner Wild, you agree to that as well? The friendly sure. one? Okay. Let's vote. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Wild? Abstain. Abstain. But, but, uh, no, no, no. You would need to vote for this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, oh, because it will get turned down. Okay, yeah, we're just we're you, just filling out the record here. They, so they, they want to see if there's if there's a chance to have the motion pass. So yeah, yeah, and and uh, so if, if if Commissioner Marks or Chair Maza abstain, then the motion would carry, or it could be a two-two, and then you can. Got you. I will retract my vote and vote yes. All righty. <laughs> Vice Chair Marks? I will go ahead and abstain. <laughs> and I'll vote no. So. Motion carries. Motion carries. Uh, so I have a motion to adjourn. The first abstention. Oh, first, uh, um, 
So you want to continue item, Richard, when can we continue item 5A to? Uh, it could be moved to the next meeting. Yeah, uh, we move. I uh, make a motion to continue 5A to the next meeting. I'll second it. Okay, uh, let's have a vote. I'm sorry, who made the motion? I did, John. Oh, thank you. And second? Uh, Mr. Jennings. Okay. Chair Mazza? I for, yes. Um, Commissioner R. Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Mark? I'm, so, I'm sorry. Commissioner Weil? Yes. And uh, Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Now before you do, I just well, I don't know whether Chris is going to be around here or not at the next meeting, but if he, he may be or may not be, but but I want to say it's been a pleasure having you on the commission and and uh, you know best of luck in all your future endeavors or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't know what to do with this either. I wasn't sure. So uh, when there was that debate, like is it next session or is it in February? I, I thought, well, I'm not going to you know jump out into that fire. So thank you, thank you, Ben. It's yeah, been a pleasure. And, and I know from personal experience that uh, that Chris worked his ass off on this uh, and had a big learning curve and he learned it. So yeah. I hope when you're elected city council, you appoint me and then I can outlast you. <laughs> oh my God. I will Sounds cut fair. my throat. I will cut my throat. <laughs> well, thank you everyone. Thanks uh, to the whole team. It's been a, a real pleasure. Great learning experience from, from the whole thing and, and to everyone on the line. I, there's still a good number here. So um, every application has been a learning experience and uh, you know, I hope I've, Given my little little push to the city to help in the right direction. Absolutely. Much appreciated. Thank you. I'll move we adjourn. I'll second it. You have a roll call. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Chair Maza? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? No. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries anyway. All right. See you guys. Tripping on. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.